you for joining us for our 2020 Science Consortium of Minority Schools virtual conference. We will be starting shortly. We have a few housekeeping notes. You will be able to submit your questions to the session moderator via the Q&A function here. If you're on a mobile device, simply tap your screen to show meeting controls. Be careful to watch your screen and answer any session polls when prompted. Thank you again for your participation and for sharing your expertise as we work to increase women and minorities in engineering careers. Now let us welcome from the Harry Medical College, Dr. Patricia Matthews Juarez, who is the Project Director for the Science Consortium of Minority Schools, Professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine, and Senior Vice President in the Office of Strategic Initiatives and Innovation, Dr. Matthews Juarez. It's four o'clock. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this wonderful, exciting session today. And the next two day will the next day will be as exciting as today opening will be. However, today we would like to start this session by introducing to you two outstanding women in engineering. They are as beautiful as they are, talented and bright and encouraging for uh, attracting young people into careers in STEM, specifically engineering for women and other and minorities. The first speaker I would like to introduce is Dr. Bernadette Hintz. Dr. Hintz uh, and I have had a growing relationship for the last uh, two years, and we have been really excited about the fact that she has agreed to be our keynote speaker. Dr. Hintz serves as a senior program manager for minority science and engineering improvement program at the United States Department of Education. She has over 19 years and the, of experience in instructional and administrative roles at both community colleges and universities and has worked in mechanical engineering technology and civil engineering technology departments. This tells us that Dr. Hintz has a wealth of knowledge and can encourage our young people who are on the call to think about a variety of, of careers in engineering. She's also served as a senior policy advisor for the White House Initiative on American Indians in Alaska Native uh, Education and a policy advisor for the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities. She has five years of experience working as a pipeline design engineering. That was pretty exciting. And she's worked on several projects, including the 48 inch, 743 miles Northwest Alaskan natural gas pipeline. I would imagine that that was really exciting. We'll hear a little bit about that during this day and a half. In 2013, she served an, uh, as a volunteer uh, worker with Kids uh, Janeer, a sign enrichment program based in Maryland, and she was and she was given the Martin Luther King Day Drum Major Award for service. She is also someone who can talk to you about real life experiences and will be a real plus for this program today. I'm also going to uh, stop and, in, and introduce Dr. Hintz, and then we will pick up and talk about uh, Dr. Renee Horton when we return. Dr. Bernadette Hintz. You're on, Dr. Hintz. Hi, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I'm gonna go ahead and start. So it is a great honor and pleasure for me to serve as your keynote speaker for the Science Consortium of Minority Schools Conference 2020, because our country's prosperity and security continues to remain dependent on graduates from the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. According to the most recent estimates, the United States awarded nearly 800,000 science and engineering first university degrees in 2016. 
broadly equivalent to a bachelor's degree. However, China produced 1.7 million science and engineering degrees. The number of these degrees in China has doubled over the past 10 years, while we've seen modest increase in the United States. Additionally, most of China increase has been in engineering, which has accounted for almost 70% of China's science and engineering first university degrees. The U.S. Department of Education Minority Science and Engineering Improvement Program is so pleased to provide funding for this key essential conference that is being put on that is led by Meharry Medical College in partnership with Fish University, Lane College, Lamont On College, Payne College, and Tennessee State University to increase the number of minorities, particularly minority women, in the field of STEM so that they enroll, graduate, and select careers in STEM and engineering field. So the Minority Science and Engineering Improvement Program supports this and other universities that have a passion for increasing students in STEM fields. Underrepresented minorities in engineering and science fields greatly diminishes our nation's competitiveness and reduces the pool of readiness in America. Therefore, it is very critical that we continue to develop strategic partnerships and methodologies such as what has been developed here. I applaud this consortium's long-standing track record of success to increase the number of African-American students, especially women who enroll, graduate, and select careers in science and engineering fields. The consortium has a significant role in contributing to the nation's diverse pool of STEM professionals and creating a more diverse pool of scientists and engineers that meet the critical needs of the minority communities in the nation. I would like to give special thanks to the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College for his leadership, um, Dr. James E. K. Hildridge, for hiring Dr. Patricia Matthews Juarez, who is the project director and uh, the lead for the Science Consortium of Minority Schools. She's also the professor of the Department of Family and Community Medicine, Senior Vice President, Office of Strategic Initiatives and Innovation. We applaud her energy and her efforts to organize this event. It goes without saying that we also want to thank Veronica Burns, who's the project director for STEM Success at Meharry, the interim vice president at FIS, Dr. Van Newkirk. I would also like to recognize Lane College, President Logan Hampton, Lamont Owen, President Carol Johnson Dean. Payne College, Cheryl Evans Jones, Dr. Cheryl Evans Jones, Tennessee State, Dr. Glenda Baskin Glover. I commend your commitment and efforts to be a vibrant beacon of hope for building a pipeline of STEM fields and preparing the next generation of STEM professionals. I look forward to the information that will be shared in this conference, and I hope that it helps to facilitate systematic approaches that build capacity and scale, sustainability, and encourage you to complete a degree in engineering. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hintz. Why you should become an engineer, future careers in STEM. So first let's look at what does an engineer do? Some of you may not be familiar with what an engineer does. So let's talk about that first. Engineers apply principles of science and math and develop economical solutions to technical problems. They invent, design, analyze, build machines, test complex systems and structures. They bring to commercial applications the links and discoveries and join them together. 
engineers change and reshape the way we live, work, and play. Some engineers work on cutting edge technology. Some work in the fields. But the game changer is 5G, the next generation of wireless. This is why it's so critical that you become an engineer at this time. There's competition to be the first to deploy the fully functional nationwide 5G network. There's competition all around the world. 5G will transform businesses, education, consumers, and most importantly, our defense. So that is why all of the countries are trying to develop 5G. 5G will give us greater speed, bandwidth, and power. Let's look at some examples of potential impact of 5G. We'll have smart cities that use sensors to collect data and manage resources much more efficiently. We'll have uh, in implantable chips that not only transmit information, but transmit it wirelessly as you walk down the street and provide the information directly to hospitals and doctor's offices and alert you of a pending problem. Engineering education prepares you for a variety of career fields, environmental engineering, agricultural engineering. There's such a wide array, array of fields that you can go into. Structural engineering. Some engineers go into medicine, law, government like myself, business management. Others go into the classroom and factories and do research. But now let's look at artificial intelligence, the capacity of a machine to simulate human intelligence. Artificial intelligence systems have to be programmed. And because they're programmed with not only rules, but heuristic rules, and it's critical that you participate. Some robots can be autonomous, like self-determining and autonomous cars. These robots, these drones have the power to kill. They're e equipped with weapons. They're called lethal autonomous weapons. These are what the military are very interested in because they're able to program constraints and descriptions and independently these devices can activate. But of course, artificial intelligence also includes facial recognition and visual objects. But we always have to encourage and include females in engineering and science. It's critical to our nation that we include all people. Engineers also work in virtual reality projects. And a virtual reality project is what you see when you play games. It's a simulation. Again, the defense is very interested in, in this area, and so is the medical field, education. There's a variety of applications that have not been tapped, but once 5G opens up, it will be. It's like running information through a straw versus running it through a five-foot pipeline. Machine learning are systems that have the ability to learn, and, and you already have been exposed to these. Your bank when they call you and let you know about problems. But the next technology that's here and here to stay are wearable technologies. So now the technologies, because of the Internet of Things, will be able to talk to each other. So you won't have to have separate technologies and devices. They'll be able to talk to each other. Why is 5G so important? Because you need power. You need speed in order to do this. So why should you be an engineer? for all of these great opportunities. So there's a part two to this presentation, future careers in STEM with the federal government. Many of you are interested 
maybe in getting a job in industry, but I want you to really consider opportunities that exist at the federal government. There are opportunities that exist while you're still a student. So I wanna help you develop a strategic plan for applying for new jobs and jobs in government in STEM. So let's see, what's the first step? The first step is you need to develop a professional email address. You shouldn't use nicknames, preferably first name dot last name at gmail.com or any other uh, email system you would like to use. Use the name that's on your birth certificate. Use your legal government name. Do not use cute names. Use your authentic name. There are several programs that are geared toward inviting talented students and recent graduates into the federal government. There's internships and full-time employment. So internships you can get while you're still in school and get paid. I want you to go and download the Pathway Program Handbook. It describes three different programs that I'm gonna talk about today. The first one is internships. Internships are paid work opportunities, part-time or full-time, related to your field of study. You can be eligible for conversion to a federal worker if you work out. Our next program that I'm gonna talk about is the Recent Graduates Program. In order to apply for this, you must apply within two years of receiving your qualified degree, but there's an exception if you're a veteran. The good thing that you need to know is that you can apply up to nine months prior to receiving your degree. So what does that mean? That means your senior year, the fall semester, you can apply for a government job under the Recent Graduates Program. The third program I wanna tell you about is the Presidential Management Fellowship or Fellows Program. This is the federal government's premier two-year leadership program for advanced degree candidates. So you need to have at least a master's. And in order to qualify for this particular program, you have to have graduated within two years of receiving your advanced degree. But you can apply in the fall of your final year of graduate school. Now, what's the strategic plan for applying for the government jobs in STEM or in other fields as well? The first thing you wanna do is establish an account on the US Jobs website, usajobs.gov. Then you wanna click on the link that says students and recent graduates. There are several events that they host to help you Today, they're having an interviewing session. They also have applications, how to fill out the applications, how to be more successful. So participate in the sponsored events. It'll give you an edge. It'll help you. Now, every time you make an application, each job requires a tailored resume to match the job description. I guarantee you won't get the job if you use a generic application resume. You want to provide specific examples that demonstrate the skills that are required. So there are plenty of government jobs. Here's a sample of them. And this is not even all of the agencies that provide internships, in particular in the STEM field. So now it's time for action. What are you gonna do? Think about it. You have the best opportunity. And if you need assistance, this is my direct telephone number and my direct email address at the US Department of Education. Please email me or call me if I can help you. Bernadette.hints at ed.gov. Thank you. That was, that was exceptionally well done, Dr. Hans, as always. 
uh, we have been so inspired by you. And when she says, please call, email, she truly means it. She's extremely passionate about this work in the field of engineering and working with young people. So we thank you so much. Your presentation was exceptional. I really love the video that when I was working with students at Lane, they would say, you can't be it if you can't see it. And that video demonstrates uh, for us that young black kids and, uh, and young black teenagers and adults are involved in engineering. Thank you so much, we appreciate that. We now move to Dr. Horton. Dr. Horton is a compelling and in international inspirational speaker. She brings her epic personal stories, her expertise and her incredible personality to each of the things that she does that are classified as award-winning presentations. She's an advocate for diversity and inclusion in science, technology, engineering, and STEM, uh, mathematics, which is STEM. She works diligently in the community and she works long hours. She believes in changing the face of STEM. She's a founder of a group called Being Inc., a nonprofit for advocating and mentoring uh, young people in STEM. She's also the past president of the National Society of Black Physicists and the author of a series uh, for children entitled Dr. H Explores the Universe. Dr. Horton, you're on. Take it away with your incredible personality. got to unmute myself. Good afternoon. I am excited about being here with you to talk about uh, what it is to be an engineer. Um, I remember growing up and being a small child and tinkering uh, in my father's garage, taking things apart and putting things back together. And so always having a very inquisitive mind. And um, my father bought me a telescope when I was uh, seven or eight. And it got me really interested in science and the rest of the world. I wanted to work for NASA growing up. And uh, I later found out that I was hearing impaired and that kind of derailed my original uh, journey. And I came full circle uh, 10 years later, going back to school with kids and all. And I get to do all those fun, amazing things now. You know, the smaller projects from NASA are the ones we get to tinker with uh, as engineers. But during my day job, I work as a quality engineer on the Space Launch System, which is the largest rocket in the world being built to date. We will go the furthest we've ever gone. Uh, we plan on circling the backside of the moon and then coming back. And then in two years from now, uh, from our first launch, we'll actually put the first woman on the moon and the next man on the moon. So I'm really excited about those things. One of the things I wanna talk about though in being an engineer is the other things that it affords you and sometimes the doors that it actually opens to allow you to get in. You know, we think in a very logical type of way uh, as engineers and as a physicist, I deal a lot with the gray and as a scientist, you deal a lot in the gray, but for engineers, it's black and white. There's a final and an end to it. And so for me, that was one of the big things about being an engineer uh, versus me doing physics, and I still do physics as well, but those two in the verses, uh, when you think about those, being an engineer, there's a final, there's something final, you have an output, and with science, sometimes we don't always have an output, and so that was one of the pluses for me about being an engineer. Um, I have now been with NASA 10 years and have worked on one flight program uh, that has flown a test flight for Orion. And then now my second project, like I said, is the Space Launch System. And I've been with that program for eight years. And then next I'm headed out to California to work on a different project, but also applying my engineering skills. Um, I find that even with my nonprofit, which is unapologetically being incorporated, which is a nonprofit to mentor those who want to be in STEM um, and not just survive in STEM, but learn how to thrive in STEM and be extremely successful um, in that place. You want to take what you are learning in school and not just apply it to uh, your career, but you also want to be able to apply that in just your normal everyday life. 
Um, I always say that when you are around and about, you want to make sure that you're always networking because you never know where someone will need you or need your skill set. And so you want to be open to being able to openly network and to be able to meet the different people and be willing to talk about what you actually do. People are intrigued about those that are in STEM or in science and even in engineering. They're very intrigued about what we do and how our brains work, right? And they want to actually know uh, what it is you do. So be able to learn to uh, talk what you do in a manner that everyone can understand it. Those are really important things um, to talk about. When you are in a space where you can network, once we get, when the world opens back up, you wanna make sure that you are talking to people who are doing the type of research that you wanna do. You're connecting with people who you are interested in the work that they're doing, or if you're just interested in that person um, as a whole overall um, to be able to do that. Uh, for me, I absolutely love working as an engineer. Um, I'm more of a hands-on person, so I do wish my day job was more of a hands-on, uh, like more like what the techs actually do, more of the touching of the hardware, the turning of the nuts, the bolts, and that kind of thing. But I do actually enjoy being able to look at the bigger picture and to be able to understand how the integrated systems actually work together and are designed to actually be together um, as well. Being at, in the type of STEM or engineering type career, um, it has afforded me to be able to travel all over the world. Um, I've attended school in Spain. Um, I've attended and given workshops in South Africa, Brazil, um, Mexico several times as well. Um, and so those are the type of things that uh, can be afforded when, you, when engineering opens up the doors for you. Um, my network of friends, uh, colleagues, expands all across vastly just different areas and different generations um, as well. And so when you go into engineering, you have to keep your mind open that there are going to be opportunities and you want to be able to walk into those opportunities. You want to be able to use your mind to be able to logically work through uh, those things. Um, one of the other things I want to talk about uh, is about adaptability. And so being an engineer, you can't be really rigid. You've got to have some adaptability because when programs and projects are happening, you want to be the one that's going to be able to be able to move from one piece of the program to the next piece of the program. And so that gives you some flexibility, not being so rigid, not being able to say that this is all my research is going to be if you're doing research or once you get into your career, only laser focused in one area. You want to be adaptable. Um, to be able to learn new things and to constantly be able to keep growing yourself as an engineer. And that's going to make you the most successful as whatever it is that you want to be able to do in, in, that, in that manner. Um, engineering should be fun. Uh, I always say when you are choosing where you want to be, you want to make sure that you're choosing that sweet spot between your talent and your passion because that's where you're going to be the happiest. The work itself is really hard work um, and long hours, as they mentioned. Sometimes it can be long hours. But the thing is, if you are happy with what you're doing and you really like what you're doing, then all of that won't matter. I'm saying it again. All of that will not matter. Like I am excited some days after working 12 or 15 hours in the factory, just simply because I know that I'm putting my footprints in history and I know that I actually make a difference in the work that I'm gonna do. So one, make sure that you're choosing not just engineering because somebody else wanted you to do it, but because you wanna do it. Two, find the type of engineering because there are lots of different engineers, right? Different types of engineering. Find the type of engineering that you love, that you can see yourself making the impact in the world with, and then pursue that and go after that. And then three, if they don't have it, find something close to it, and then find out how to mold it into what you really want to do. See, the catch is if you've got to be working hard at something and you want to be successful at it, also make sure that you're happy at it. I'm happy every day building rockets, right? I'm happy every day when I'm going through the paperwork. I really enjoy being an engineer and you can too. You can find that place where you can make an impact in the world and actually make a change. So you can find my nonprofit, Unapologetically Being Incorporated at unapologeticallybeing.org or you can find me at reneehortonphd.com 
uh, or on any social media at Renee Horton PhD as well. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful, Dr. Horton. Uh, you lived up to your uh, uh, bio uh, and we are really excited about the work that you're doing. Uh, there are no uh, questions in the chat box uh, right now, but I will ask a couple of questions. I'll first start with Dr. Hintz and ask Dr. Hintz, if I was a student um, and living at home, uh, graduating from a HBCU, what kind of, before I graduate, what kind of internships should I think about before I uh, uh, apply for a uh, in internship uh, at, uh, say, at NASA? Uh, what are the kinds of internships should I, what steps should I take and what do they look like? Dr. Hintz? It looks like we've lost Dr. Hintz. Okay. Le well, well let's go. That one about NASA. Um, we have the Pathways program um, that you would apply for um, on the, to be able to uh, actually be um, an intern at NASA. And so Dr. Hintz, she actually mentioned uh, about the Pathways program. And so you could go out to USA.gov uh, USA US, usajobs.gov and you can look up the pathways program for NASA and you can look at the different centers to see who actually has an opening and that is actually the way NASA actually even hires their civil servants um, is through that pathways program they would like you to do an intern first so for everybody out there who'd like to work for NASA I did mine through a fellowship way um, I had a NASA Jenkins, the, a Harriet Jenkins fellowship. And then after my fellowship ended, I ended up uh, going over to NASA eight months later. But now they use the Pathways program. So you do want to go and apply out there um, on the portal to be able to apply for those jobs. And they always have them open at every center. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Can you give us an example of if I was out there looking, what would it look like? Um, what would I, what would I be looking for? Engineer, uh, um, what, what would be the captions in terms of the types of jobs that I would apply for under the pathway program? It would be an engineering job. You could, um, actually, actually, let me take, I'm, I'm familiar with the, uh, engineering jobs, right? So it would be considered an AST, which is our engineering jobs, but Wonderful. because NASA hires, all walks of life to be able to get the job done. Um, you can look under artists, you can look under um, business, computer science, those different things as well, because NASA would hire those as well. Wonderful. Uh, we're we're going to keep asking uh, questions until we can get Dr. Hans back on. So you're it, Dr. Horn. She's, she's back on, but I will add, answer whatever I need to answer. Oh, she's back on. Wonderful. Uh, uh, Dr. Hintz, we were just asking about the uh, internship uh, pathway, and Dr. Horton was very helpful in, in describing that internship for us. If uh, I was a student with limited resources, uh, my parents um, uh, unable to pay for my summer away from home and I wanted to go to Ohio or I wanted to go to Washington DC to intern at the Department of Ed in, in MISF in the engineering program. What would you recommend uh, for that type of student, Dr. Hans? Is she back on? She is. But I recommend yeah, she is. Try to, um, find a grant that that institution has to see if we can allow the institution to sponsor that student through those funds. I know this summer we were able to sponsor 20 students from HBCUs that work at Air Force Research National Laboratory um, in New York. They did a virtual internship. So this is uh, very special and new because um, Air Force had never created a virtual internship program. And so the other thing I wanna tell a student that doesn't have a lot of resources, 
is to maybe consider a virtual internship. And in some cases, um, the faculty can help you locate those. Uh, we're here at the department, we can try to help you. And I'm sure uh, other people at your institution can too. Wonderful. Uh, there is a question in the chat box from uh, Dr. Hargrove. Uh, this is for um, either Dr. Hintz or Dr. Harden. Have you been mentored in your career as a physicist? You said how? How, he asked oh. how. Okay, um, so I started with the National Society of Black Physicists as an undergrad. I mean, I'm sorry, as a graduate student. And my mentoring came directly from those that were in the program um, or those that were already um, professionals uh, at that time. Um, Dr. April El Hadari, um, I met her at the beginning of my graduate career and she mentored me um, through uh, becoming a, a professional myself. Um, and so for me, um, not only that, I also had mentors that did not look like me in physics. Uh, my very first advisor was a really good mentor um, when I was at the University of Alabama. And he attended a lot of the minority conferences with me so that he was fully aware of that feeling I always felt of being one of the only um, in there. And so he was able to actually get that particular um, type of experience as well, right? The counter experience that I had every single day while I was there. Um, and then I had a few other mentors as well that were outside of physics that just helped me really be able to endure and to be able to learn to, to find my footing itself in STEM and in physics. Great, thank you. Dr. Hintz, uh, you have achieved quite a lot. I like the idea of being out in Alaska uh, on the pipeline. How did you uh, come to think about engineering and who were you mentored by? We, we, we understand from uh, Dr. Harden, she had a variety of, of mentors, uh, someone that didn't look like her and someone who looked like her. How about you? How did that, uh, how did mentoring and advising occur for you? Well, um, I had mentors of all shapes, sizes, nationalities that helped me to find my path in engineering. So I was at a college, I was majoring in chemistry. I intended to be a medical doctor. I went on a field trip to a chemical engineering plant with my class and I discovered, wow, there's chemical engineers out here. I don't know what they do, but whatever they do, they need way more of them than they need chemists. But I had never heard of engineering before I went to college. So I didn't take drafting before I went to college. Uh, I didn't have that special preparation. I had math and science preparation, but not the additional preparation that uh, my male counterparts had in class. So drafting was in college, it was a difficult class for me because of the amount of time that I had to spend, but I put the energy into it and the effort into it. And I read about it and I had people encouraging me in my family, at the institution and the few small number of blacks that were there. And I can count on one hand, I went to engineering school in the seventies. So there were no females in my class of any nationality. So the few blacks that were there at the University of Houston uh, encouraged me, helped me, tutored me a little bit and that's how I made it through. That's but I made it through with a lot of help from international students mm -hmm. because my engineering program consisted of people from Egypt, Jordan, uh, China, uh, Japan. And so I would just ask, can I study with you? Um, what grade did you make on that test and insert myself? So that's how I made it through. That's wonderful. You and Dr. Horton are on the same path way in terms of looking at how we change the face of engineering so that more of us uh, that look like us, minority uh, African-Americans, uh, uh, Latinx, um, uh, Native Americans, everyone can be on this path, and especially women. Uh, we've come a long way, but we have such a long way to go. Uh, what would you uh, advise uh, at faculty members at uh, HBCUs to do? And I'll start with Dr. Horton, and then I'll come back to you, Dr. Hans. What do you think is important uh, as we pull together this consortium to increase the number of individuals who uh, can uh, change the face 
of engineering. Uh, we also want to let you know that the um, question and answer session is open to students and to our program coordinators. So please ask your questions. We have a few more minutes uh, to engage these wonderful experts. Dr. Horton, what would you advise? I would actually like to start by saying that I think um, we as humans need to be a little bit more compassionate. Um, there is so much happening um, that these students are encountering that we didn't encounter. We were dealing with maybe being the only in our schools, but when you start talking about those kids at the HBCUs, they're seeing other kids who look like them. They're seeing other people who can thrive like them. The catch is you have no idea what they're going through when they're not in your classroom. So I would say we need to start with being a little bit more compassionate and we need to go back to the village mentality, right? That it took a village to raise our kids. Well, it actually takes a village to raise all of our black engineers and black scientists as well, to be able to get them out there and let them know that, hey, the world may be against you, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not against you. I'm, I'm here for you. Um, and I know it takes a whole lot of the professors, my hats off to them for those that are actually doing it. But I know I ran into some really uh, cruel professors, ones that didn't think as a woman I should be in physics or ones that didn't think as a woman with children that I should be doing this, that I should have been at home and been a caregiver to my kids. You know, everybody's path is different. Um, and you have to be able to take those type of biases out of your own suitcase when you're dealing with these kids to be able to make sure that they are successful. You, you know, regardless of what their backgrounds are, or where they're coming from, or what path they took to get there, they're sitting in that classroom for a reason. And as the professor, you want to make sure that you are helping them be the most successful that you can be to be able to, you know, put these, to get them out there and to be able to give us those seats at the table. You know, it doesn't do any good just to open the door and to have a seat at the table. It, you know, you have to have a voice at the table as well. But you can't stifle them bringing them through the program, right? Telling them this and that or, or just being harsh about it and then expect them all of a sudden to find their way once they graduate. So you got to be able to nurture them while they're going through if you want them to be able to make those changes and impact the world. That's an excellent uh, statement. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, is Dr. Hans still on? I, yes, I'm still here. So how, what would you think uh, we should be doing as faculty and career uh, builders at the HBCUs to ensure that we are encouraging minority students and women to go into engineering? Well, I think we need to have one-on-one -on -one talks with them. I think we need to encourage the students not to wait until their senior year before they even think about a job. You know, part of your part of the job of going to college is networking and understanding the industry that you're going to go into. And many students may graduate and not know a professional in the industry outside of their faculty. They may not have attended conferences and taken those conferences seriously. They need to network. This is a social media time in America. You don't even have to go to the conference. You can meet people virtually. You can meet them in Twitter. And you need to start tweeting professionally and pay attention to your social media account. If you're going to get a government job, you're going to go through a background check. And if you've had a lot of negative things on your social media platform, you won't know why you didn't get selected, but you won't be selected. So I, I think that they really need to uh, go to conferences and meet with their faculty members and have mentors that are outside of your university. We're in the, the video age now. So I think that would really help broaden them and, and make friends with seniors mm -hmm. at the institution. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, the idea of the courses that one takes as foundational courses. And I'll start back with you, Dr. Hintz. They are chemistry, physics, math. Uh, they're also the arts. Um, uh, if a student, and you, you sort of hinted at it, if a student really want engineering and, and tend to uh, shy away from chemistry, physics, or math, uh, what would be your recommendation uh, for that student? Well, my recommendation would be to take a deep breath, 
and understand that you're going to have to be successful in chemistry, physics, and math. That is the language of engineering. You can't engineer if you don't understand the science. So I suggest that they get tutors, they put the energy and effort together and change their mindset and work really hard, get, get Shams outlines, things like that to help. Yes. And, and Dr. Horton, uh, I want you to uh, share a little bit about the messages that you use to inspire uh, the young people that you are working with to change the face of, of, of the engineering field that you have identified. What are some of the messages? We talked a little bit about the fact that uh, as faculty members, we need to be encouraging, we need to be nurturing, we need to provide tutoring, uh, uh, we need to offer one-to-one -one, as uh, Dr. Hintz uh, uh, laid out. Uh, both of you have spent a lot of time working with the younger generation to build this confidence and this courage and this uh, skill base to get into engineering. What are some of the key messages that you think are important uh, to give students, uh, messages that inspire? You know, for me, um, I'm always focusing on the fact that this is fun. This is cool. This is amazing um, when I'm doing the things that I'm doing, right? And I think our kids need to be able to have that wow factor. They need to be able to see that wow factor in what we do. Our world is so uh, materialized and commercialized with everything else, right? Basketball is fun. So being a basketball player is fun. Being a football player is fun. When you start looking at those things, but those guys are leading exciting lives. And then when you see an engineer, you know, if you kind of Google and if you're looking at the white engineer, you're watching, looking at a guy in a white button up shirt with a pocket protector. And it's like, yeah, I don't want to be that. That's not what I want to be. So I think when we are our, our authentic selves and we're out front and we're mentoring these students and they can see who we are, who we truly are and how we're normal people having just a great time, but we're using our intellect and our brain to be able to make these impacts and change in the world, right? I think that for me is how I reach through to try to be able to make that change and to get these kids interested. I want them to know that they can do this and, and it can be a, in a fun, interesting, and a, you know, an outrageous kind of way. Um, I love all the scientists that are, that are tweeting, um, all the black scientists and engineers that are tweeting, right? Um, and talking about the work that they're doing and showing the cool apparatus that they're working with. And so they're giving their engineering perspective to a, a wow factor in it, to be able to show that these kids that this is something that, hey, that you can thrive in and that you could, you know, it could be an amazing uh, thing to actually do. So I think that's really important as well. Wonderful. I, I wanted to uh, come back and uh, we're going to have two, we have two questions in the chat box. I think that uh, Fisher S Smith, uh, who I have uh, known for a long time at Lane, uh, working with her on the wellness project, we have already answered her question in, in some way, but I'm going to read it uh, there too, just in case we, uh, either you, Dr. Hans, or Dr. Horton would like to add to it. She writes, what can we do to increase an interest in STEM among African-Americans? The second part of her question was also, what do we need to do to help prepare students to be successful in STEM? I think we've answered that in part, but if there's any additional information, uh, what would you add? Let's go to Dr. Hintz. Okay, I wanna take the first question dealing with increasing interest. So we know at the Department of Education, by the third grade, a student is permanently turned off from math and science without a proper intervention. So what does that mean? That means that they have to have science experiences that are fun. In China, students are beginning to learn physics in the third grade. In middle school, some of them have patents. We are just as smart, we just need the exposure. So I would suggest that students be placed in more camps, whether they're virtual or uh, in person, so they can have that wow, fun factor and get that passion because they have to be taught by 
people that love science, not people that dread science, that do it because it's required for them to teach, but they keep fun because they don't like it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that is the most critical thing. And I think the students that are on the line can all play a very important role in helping to bring along the next generation. Because just like uh, they're in college, there are elementary kids that don't know what an engineer looks like, anything about the fun wow factor of engineering. And I think the students that are on the line today can help us remedy that problem. Yes, excellent. Uh, anything to, that you want to add, Dr. Horton, before we go to the next question? So I think the second part of her question was also, what do we need to do to help prepare these students, right? And I just want to piggyback on what Dr. Han said, and that is make sure that these kids are getting these experiences early on, right? There's so many creative ways to be able to do it. My grandson is three, about to be four, um, and my girlfriend's son just turned eight, and he was, a, he was absolutely crazy about Legos. Well, Legos is construction. That's engineering, you know? You have to introduce it to them in a way that seems like it's fun. So when you swing it on them later, like, yeah, you were doing math and you were doing engineering, right? They're like, oh, okay, well, I'm not afraid of that. Like that's something that I know I can actually do. So I think it's really important that you start, that we start really early. Um, you know, when you say in my third grade, they're already turned off. I mean, just think if they weren't turned off by third grade, uh, she's saying patents in middle school, what your kid could be doing if they weren't turned off, if they you know, weren't excited. Um, when it comes to camps, make sure you're getting quality camps, camps with a um, track record, right? Ones that have shown that they produce kids that have gone through the programs and have been good. We just need to really learn to support those type of programming. I think the other thing that you, both you and Dr. Hintz are really uh, pushing us to think about is that the same way we say to our young, uh, our children, uh, oh, he wants to be a doctor. And then you, you build this cadre of things around, you wanna right. be a doctor. You give them a stethoscope, you, you buy them a white coat, you, they walk around with little black bags. Uh, and so that, the, that we have to do intentional uh, messages around engineering and around other areas of, of interest that we think should broaden out this large uh, re uh, repository of information that, that young people, that children need. Uh, the second thing that I think that we're really hitting upon is that there needs to be a, a circle or a, a, a village uh, that reinforce those messages, that it doesn't matter what you, where you come from, what you look like, what really should matter is aspiration and expectation and hope. And that if someone can say to you, success for me is more than a dream, because I'm on my way to become a future engineer uh, as a woman, uh, an owner of a company, uh, a, uh, uh, an administrator who works for the United States Department of, of, uh, Department of Education who's focusing on uh, minorities and engineering. If we can say that this is your pathway, uh, that, uh, you know, I think about the movie where, uh, these black women uh, were computers <laughs> uh, and they helped launch uh, the first, ro the rocket ship. And, and I think that we, we have to think about what messages that we are providing in our educational system, not just at home, but if we're going to look across uh, these uh, various uh, categories of careers, how do we get high schools, well, elementary schools and high school on board to give more than a cautionary tale about, uh, cautionary tale about math, physics, and chemistry? You know, I grew up in a rural community and the faculty, the teacher who taught chemistry 
also taught biology. He, he also taught physics and he had, <laughs> he taught calculus. <laughs> okay. So you begin to say to yourself, uh, is he that skilled? But it was, you know, you didn't, the issue of recruitment into the school systems where you have, uh, you know, a, a group of people, teachers who really want to work uh, in this area. So we have to think about rural education, we have to think, think about urban education, and we have to think about uh, everything in between in order to promote uh, engineering uh, uh, for African-Americans as a pathway and certainly for, uh, for women. Uh, we have about uh, five more minutes. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, two last questions. Uh, one is to uh, Dr. Horton to tell us what is the Black Association of Physicists? What does it look like? What is the membership? How much does it cost? Can you, is, <laughs> Is, okay. there, so the, is, um, is, is there a website? <laughs> there, there is. Um, the, it's the National Society of Black Physicists. So NSB, as in boy, P, um, dot org is the website um, that can be reached at. So NSBP is an organization of about 300 and plus um, African Americans and our allies um, in the organization. So made up of students and professionals. Um, in the organization as well. It is uh, the, the largest and the only organization uh, for black physicists um, to date. Um, we started out at Morgan State uh, University. So started at an HBCU is where it was founded at. Um, and that organization is there to actually be able to nurture, mentor the future physicists, the future black physicists, and to stand as a place where you can actually go and find uh, the authority on black physicists, right? Um, in that, um, I served as the second female president um, of the organization um, back in 2016. Um, it is, we're doing really good things. They have a virtual conference this year in November. Um, so if you're out there and you wanna know more about the organization, please go and register. Um, student membership is like five or $10, something like that. And if you are a member of SPS, you get joint membership into NSBP as well. Um, you can always find a mentor there. Um, it's a great place to be able to find mentors that look like you, um, that know what you're going through, or some have been through worse, and so you'll be able to go there and, and actually be able to find that as well. And that was one of the things I wanted to mention about you know, engineering. We talked about that, and you said, what do we do about the school system? It's not just about the school system either. It's about what's being done at home, right? You've got to be able to nurture your kids at home to be able to say, do you want to be an engineer? You know, I can't go get you a lab coat, but I can go get you some building blocks, or I can get you some Legos, or I can get you some you know, the bridge building kits, let's see, you know, how many popsicles it takes to build a bridge and how many books or pennies can you put on that? So it's gonna be really important that it's not just done in schools, that it's also done at home. Um, but with NSBP, you can find us online, you can find us on Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook uh, as well, uh, to find out all the great things that we are actually doing. We sponsor some of our own scholarships uh, and internships come straight through us as well. Um, and so the organization is just growing and doing great things. But it, like I said, it, for me, it provided a, a safe space and wow. a networking uh, place for me every year for the conference. Wonderful. And Dr. Hans, I want to say to you that this conference is really a, a bow to your expertise and your influence uh, on uh, us here at Meharry Medical College as someone who has been very passionate about women in engineering and someone who took the time to uh, establish for the first time uh, uh, in the Department of Education, a consortium of minority schools who's focusing on engineering. So this conference is, is in essence dedicated to the hard work that you have put in all these years uh, as someone who has been championed uh, women and minorities, African-Americans into engineering. So the, the issue for me is that 
we need to look up to women like you and Dr. Horton and all this, uh, all these other wonderful women that are on this conference today. And these, we all are here to pay, to offer thanks uh, to women like each of us that are making this world run. So we thank you so much. We, uh, Dr. Hans, you got a half a second to give your email one more time to my the group. My email is my first name, Bernadette H-E-N-C-E, -E, at ed.gov. And for the student that had the question about the internships, some internships pay for your transportation and your housing. So don't Wonderful. think because you don't have money that you can't do an internship. Thank you so Wonderful. much for this wonderful conference and this opportunity. I salute you all. Thank you so much. And we say, uh, stay tuned. We have lots of exciting things to do. And thank you so much. And engineering offers so many uh, opportunities for uh, growth and personal satisfaction. Uh, knowing that one does uh, can produce uh, practical solutions for the world's problems. Thank you. Good afternoon. Normal people having a great time to change the world. Thank you. I'm Kermit Payne and thank you for joining us for Biomedical Engineering and Health Profession Careers. STEM is a multidisciplinary and is multidisciplinary and its related fields, especially engineering, are increasing in demand and a link to the general shift towards everyday utilization of machine and technology in all aspects of life and contribute to the development of life-saving concepts. Our first speaker, Dr. Andre Churchwell, is noted as a cardiologist cardiologist, and he combines his clinical administrative and leadership skills as an influencer. Dr. Churchwell is the chief diversity officer for Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He is a senior associate dean for diversity affairs at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He's a professor of medicine and cardiology and a professor in radiology and radiological services, and also a professor in biomedical engineering. You can find more information about Dr. Churchwell in your digital program on page 29, or you can catch him on YouTube singing Look Like a Silver Lining with this lesson to make it shine on you. Welcome, Dr. Churchwell. Thank you. Sure, I'm not muted. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Great. Well, I really welcome the opportunity to, to chat here. I've actually talked, uh, Dr. Juarez is someone you never say no to. And I've talked uh, at other venues for her uh, that are all about trying to build more uh, African-Americans in STEM. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. This is about engineering. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm here to share what I call my life journey. And my life journey will give you some examples, hopefully, of how you can do things uh, from different lenses, okay? That there's not just one way to get to a career end. You sh and, and so I, I hope to walk you through uh, my life and share uh, my journey and to where I've come from, from East Nashville, here in Nashville, Tennessee, to here to at Vanderbilt. I start off with my family. My parents, you gotta start with who, who brought you to the dance. My parents have left me. My, Mom left us in February of this year, but boy, they were phenomenal. Um, choose your parents wisely is one of the things I would certainly recommend to all of you all out there. Uh, they were committed to education. Dad is, was called the Jackie Robinson of Southern journalism, a writer, a graduate of Fisk University who knew I was interested in science and engineering, but spent his entire life teaching me how to write properly. I might add, it was until my 40th birthday as I would send him my papers, scientific and others, that he finally quit putting red ink on the papers and said, Andre, you can finally write. You are on your own now. <laughs> and that was, I was very thought, I was very thankful that he spent his time to mentor me. Another thing I heard earlier from the other speakers, you need to have mentors. And my parents were my, my mentors. My mom and dad were my life coach mentors. And I listened very much to his model life. Being from Nashville, we started a little small home. This is the Churchwell home. It's probably no more than 2,000 square feet. 
There's seven people live there, two adults and five children. I'll share some more of that in a minute. The largest room in the house was my dad's library. This is the den in his library. It's the only room in the house that had an air conditioner unit in the wall. So if you could do everything you wanted to do, but if you wanted to read and study, uh, you'd have to come back there. And he would, he would be very mindful about what you were reading. And he had a huge library of books that covered every major topic that you can imagine. And this was his wall of fame, he called it. If you succeeded in something, he would put you on the wall. So we, my brothers and I became physicians. So he had portraits made. So that's me with my brother, Keith. And that's me on the other side of my brother, his, his twin, Kevin. They're twin physicians. And they were interns at the time when I was uh, a resident at Grady Memorial Hospital in Emory. You can see dad meeting Mar uh, Muhammad Ali there and all kind of awards. And it was really a challenge for us to find a spot to put an award. So find someone that's going to challenge you, to daily challenge you, but love you at the same time. Next slide. One thing I would recommend, and I'm going to, uh, I would hope that Dr. Juarez and others could, will send this to you. Find great mentors that will teach you and stay in your life. And Will, Willis Hurst was my great mentor in medicine and cardiology, the chair of medicine in Emory. And he shared everything. You know, most of the time mentors only share what they do, like a research mentor or someone that teaches you how to listen to the heart, like, like, like Dr. Hurst. But he shared everything, like his favorite statement about what it meant to be a professional man uh, that was delivered by Albert Tuttle at Emory at the graduation ceremony in 1957. I won't read the whole thing, but I want you to, to, to listen to a couple of things. Do not debase yourself by equating your souls to what they will bring in the market. Do not be a miser. Hoarding your talents and abilities and knowledge either among yourselves or in your dealings with your patients or clients. Rather be reckless and spendthrift. Pour out your talent on whom all it can be serviced. Throw it away, waste it, and in spending it, it will be increased. Do not keep a watch for eye lest you slip and give away a little bit of what you might have sold. Don't censor your thoughts to gain a wide audience. Love people, give it all away, and in giving it away, it gives, it, it actually gains greater value. So that's the service of a professional man, a professional woman. It's in what you deliver, what you have, those values, your skills, you know, you're going to make a good living, but don't hold anything back. Next slide. And this just kind of echoes, you can see it real close. If you're a professional person, you have no goods to sell, no land to till, your asset is yourself. So what is the, the share of a man worth? If he does not can, contain the quality of integrity, he's worthless. If he does, he's priceless. The value is either nothing or infinite. So work on, you know, issues around integrity, work on what you consider to be your life's goals, whether it be science, engineering, or medicine, or some combination like that, that was obviously my goal to be. Next slide. Next slide after that. So, you know, I chose initially an engineering path through Vanderbilt. I was an engineering undergraduate in biomedical engineering, did research, but thought I could probably be both an engineer and a scientist or a biomedical engineer. So I went through training in medicine first after I finished Bandy Engineering School and went to Harvard Med School, from Harvard Med School to Emory in Atlanta and spent 17 years there. I was on the Emory resident and these are some of my Emory buddies who came with me to create the cardiology program here at Vanderbilt. To the left is my younger brother, Keith, who you saw on the other slide. There he is with the big glasses on. And so one of the things about mentoring is I mentored my younger brothers. They saw my path in medicine, and so they followed me. I went to Vandy and then the Harvard Med School in Emory for training. Kevin to the left, Keith's twin, went to MIT for engineering education, Vandy Med School, and trained at Children's at Harvard. Keith, to your right, with the big saucer glasses, went to Harvard College, Wash U Med School, and trained at Emory in cardiology. So... Follow great mentors, listen to what their path is. Maybe their life story and path matches what you think yours should be, okay? Look at your skills. Are there math, science, art, design, or some combination of all that? Also keep looking and exploring what your creativity is. I don't want you to think that you're just limited in one area. I'm gonna share with you that you have creativity you need to explore because it will inform your science and your engineering and your math. This is the Churchwell family gathered, my dad and mom in the middle there, and they're the brothers. So that's seven, seven folks that lived in that house. This is at my brother's wedding. Next slide. 
So as I was in Emory, I was fortunate enough at Grady to be the first black chief resident at Grady Hospital. And so that offered me an opportunity for a whole year to teach all the residents and run that 1100 bed hospital that many of you know about that sits in the middle of Atlanta. You, I, I saw all types of medical illnesses and varieties and shapes. And I spent a whole the, a year there honing my medical skills because you gotta be a good doctor first before you become a good biomedical engineering physician who's gonna apply the medicine in science and engineering to solve medical problems. You gotta understand the medical problems first. So this is a, just a, a quick tour of my year there at, at Grady. They spent the annual report. That's me coming through the front door a little bit skinnier at 6.20 in the morning to start teaching the residents. Next slide. That's me meeting them at early in the morning as we gather for bad coffee to go over the cases that came in the hospital the night before at Grady. Next slide. That's me in the emergency room at Grady Hospital, listing the cases, deciding who gets admitted, teaching the residents. Next slide. That's Willis Hurst, my great mentor, cardiology mentor, with me in EKG rounds with the students, teaching the students about electrocardiograms. I spent 13 years learning from this man and learning, once again, not just medicine, but a life story. There I'm back in the emergency room in that one day, talking to the residents, trying to decide how to treat and manage these complex sick patients. Next, next slide. And But I... At the time I was there in medicine, I still had that engineering burning desire and design and applying engineering to medicine. So I worked with my colleagues, Joel Fellner to the left, cardiologist, and Ajit Yoganathan, a PhD in fluid mechanics and, and engineering, and my buddy Don Giddens, next slide, to build the Emory Georgia Tech Biomedical Research Center. So they, I was one of the key people, there was about six or seven of us, both from Emory and Georgia Tech, that had the vision to build the Emory Georgia Tech Biomedical Engineering Research Center that many of you know about now. And that was in 1987. At this point in my training, I was so excited about going back and applying those engineering skills in cardiology. I would see people that showed up in the hospital with heart attacks. And to me, heart attacks were, were caused by these tubes called coronary arteries that would, that, that would develop blockages in them and would occlude the artery and cause death to the heart muscle. And sometimes people would die from these. But I saw them through the vision of a fluid mechanics engineer who saw tubes and blood flow. So there was physics involved in that blood flow. And Don Giddens, my great mentor to the right, another research mentor who was chair of aerospace engineering also had the crazy idea that the flow in the coronary is very much like the flow in any tube system where governed by the same physical principle called, called Reynolds number, the ratio of inertial to viscous forces no matter if it's a small tube of three millimeters like your coronary arteries or 100 millimeters in diameter, that Reynolds number defined the flow characteristics of the flow in that coronary artery. So we had the idea that if you could find out where there were low velocity areas in branches, that could be where early plaques would settle and develop and grow. And in fact, we were right about that. If you look at what's in front of us, that's a flow rig. And there's a lesion, a model lesion of the left anterior descending artery with a stenosis in it. And we studied this using all types of laser Doppler studies. I'm not going to get into that, but we were able to clearly point out by looking at this and then pairing them up with coronary arteriograms to find where early lesions would develop in the coronary arteries. And it turned out Don and I did this work in the late 80s, and that research has born, was born, uh, had borne fruit in terms of it is guiding principles of how we understand where early atherosclerotic lesions develop and grow. So that was some seminal early work. I didn't stop there. I was involved in minority affairs work. So, so you have to look at all your talents. I was very keen about getting African-American kids in med school at Emory. So we started the minority affairs office, Laura Mitchell and I, and we started working to admit African-American kids from Morehouse, Spelman, Land University, all over the South, Emory Medical School. And that's what I'm doing now at Vanderbilt. Next slide. So once again, back to my dad, the guiding force in my understanding of, of being a man, being a contributor to society. All of his writings uh, as a journalist were then placed in the Emory Rare Books section. Uh, and there, there you have it. There it is. And you can go to Emory Library, Woodruff Library, and look for the Robert Churchill manuscripts. I want to point out again, this is dad's library here. Okay, look at that library. Look at all those books and the Harvard classics. He would say either you cut grass in the neighborhood to pay for college, Andre, or you read these books and write a report in my air conditioned library for $300 and I'll give you the money without having to cut the grass. Well, you knew what choice I made, my goodness. His air conditioned library was a hell of a lot easier. So reading all that stuff and then 
working and looking at how what other skills and talents I had. Dad knew I could draw and sketch, and he challenged me to take the drawing and sketching to build these models of thinking of the heart, a ways to think about world problems from a more design point of view. What do I mean by that? So when I work, oftentimes I draw things out in a thought model. Well, this is one drawing, it's not a thought model, but it's me wearing a suit that I designed that's a sketch and, a, and an ink sketch. And so I use the creativity side to stimulate my brain to solve the cardiac, the cardiology problems. I just finished this. I think you know who that is, don't you? This is a, a, a pencil and ink sketch of John F. Kennedy that I did just the other day. This will go on the wall of my office here uh, in, at Vanderbilt. So I really want to make the case that it's really pivotal to listen to those other voices, those creative voices in your head that in fact will inform what you do during your day, day job. So look to the creative side of your brain. Go back to the slide before. So, so it's my crazy thinking that led me to believe that as we tried to educate students about how to make decisions, it occurred to me that you use the brain where the knowledge is, but your heart informs what you do. If it's your family member, you're gonna think harder and work harder, right? To solve that problem. So think of your patients like your family and then all the experiences you've had, bad or good, your so-called gut feelings, will also inform decision-making. So Steve Martin was wrong. You have three brains, not two brains, as he has in the drawing here. Next slide. And so using that design thinking, this is a, this is a, uh, a model that I have created that I use to teach young physicians and young scientists who are working in cardiology how to think about guiding your thinking to solve problems. So I talked to you, look to the left of the diagram, I talked about the gut and the knowledge brain and the heart that help you stay connected to your parental teachings and humanism. And they'll guide you in making the right decisions because you'll care and you'll have knowledge in equal amounts. But there have to be other things that sustain a, a career of 20 or 30 years, right? Whether it be in science or medicine or some combined hybrid career. And so these are, this is like a, a gain factor that engineers use. There are different gain factors that drive you in the course of, of your life to stay in the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the practice of medicine. Is it purely financial? I hope not. That'll be a weak gain because that can't sustain 30 years of getting up at five o'clock in the morning to work on your research or take care of patients. It has to be things like the inner satisfaction of, of serving mankind. It has to be, uh, go back, I'm sorry, go back to the other side. It has to be applying evidence-based medicine. It has to be the intellectual decision. It has to be the task management those are the kind of things that should sustain you. Next slide. And you have to then learn along the way how to partition making decisions so you're not constantly overusing too much of your energy thinking everything's important. Not everything is urgent or important. You have to think about how to partition your energy and your decision making process. Next slide. And you have to then decide, do you, do, do you go to something quickly or do you, in meaning immediate service or do you put problems in long-term parking to reflect on them more? So you have to have these thought models that I've used out of my engineering training to help me actually solve medical problems, administrative problems, and scientific problems. Next slide. So I end the story as I began. My father, guiding principal, life coach mentor, embedded in me the idea of the importance of the life of the mind and reaching into my creative self to then to use that to then engage my right and left brain in ways that help me solve problems in very interesting and unique ways using drawing, three-dimensional models, and the like. This is Dad's school in Nashville, the Robert Churchill Museum Magnet School, named after him. It's an interesting story. This school was actually named the Wharton School. It sits right in Black North Nashville, right down the street from Fisk University. And when it was put there in the 1930s, it was named after a Confederate general. How about that one? Well, someone got enough wisdom and, and guidance to take that name off the bill and redesign the school and name it after one of their cherished heroes of North Nashville, Robert Churchwell. So I hope this has been a helpful look. In that school, Dad's sayings are all over the place and other people who he quoted. So young kids, elementary school kids, when they come in that building, they're going to be surrounded by the words of Robert Churchwell and those people who he valued, whether it be Tennyson or Shakespeare or the like. And that's Dad there. So open for questions if there's opportunity for questions there, uh, Kermit, or uh, certainly the audience and from, from the faculty here.
We're going to come back, Dr. Churchwell, for um, a wrap up of questions and answers. Um, as we've heard, thank you so very much. Normal people having a great time to change the world, creativity and exploring. Thank you very much, Dr. Churchwell. We'll hear more from you in the question and answer section in just a few minutes. Dr. Melanie McReynolds has published extensively on biochemistry, molecular biology, cellular and energy metabolism. She represents Al Alcorn State, whose pre-professional programs is committed to preparing a career in law, medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, veterinary medicine. And for those who want to enroll in graduate schools with PhD programs in biological, chemical, physical, and biomedical sciences. Dr. McReynolds is the Hannah Gray Postdoctoral Fellow and Burroughs Welcome Awardee at Princeton University. Dr. McReynolds also aims to establish an independent research group where her future lab will shed light on met metabolic aging and disease. And you can find more information about Dr. McReynolds on page 32 of your digital program. Welcome, Dr. McReynolds. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, um, Mr. Payne, for that wonderful introduction. And before I start, I really would like to thank the organizers of this amazing conference to empower um, Black students to pursue STEM, pursue the engineering, mathematics, and science careers for giving me the opportunity to share my life story and my lived experiences with you all today. I've been very, um, I've been motivated myself by the session before this one and the prior speaker. And I think that what I have to add will really bring everything together. I'm in a space where um, I can share, I've just, made it to the other side. So where many of the students are right now, I was just there a couple of years ago. And so over the next five minutes or so, I kind of want to share how I made it over this last decade. So first to just kind of give a general gist of who I am. I am Melody McReynolds. I'm originally from Mississippi. So I attended, um, as Mr. Payne mentioned in the introduction, Alcorn State University, where I majored in chemistry and physics. Ever since I was a child, I always had a love for chemistry um, and math and science. However, I took every single science class in high school, but I was never really exposed to the laboratory experience. But I knew that it was something about being in the lab that I was very interested in um, pursuing. So when I went to undergrad at Alcorn State, I took advantage of every single, I took advantage of the, um, exposures that are given via um, the NIH and the NSF, there are so many internship mechanisms. And a lot of people talked about that already, but from my freshman year, every single opportunity that came before me, I took advantage of it to get more experience. And also, you know, to go to medical school and various professional schools, um, people encourage internships, but internships really do give that um, foundation to what science and math and engineering, et cetera, all has to offer. So what exactly do I do? So as the, um, I study metabol, I'm, I'm a scientist. I would say I'm a chemical, I'm a chemist trained biologist. My research centers at the center centers around metabolism and aging. So aging is one of the strongest risk factors for all of the pre for the majority of the prevalent diseases that impact our nation today. And we probably all have family members where we could see as soon as we begin to age, we see that decline beginning to happen. There's a wise quote that states, Age is a gift of art, is a work of art. However, oh, you know, um, I guess just to, going through this week as well, I'm dealing with my mother. Um, I've been back and forth to Mississippi and with her health. So this is really something that's personal for me right now. So to um, so think about all of those metabolic diseases, heart disease, kidney failure, multiple myeloma, et cetera, if we really wanna, um, understand and solve these issues and really benefit the fruit of our labor when we age, we have to ask the questions that really matter the most to our communities. So that's where my passion comes from 
for being at the bench and being a scientist and transitioning into faculty positions. Going through this pipeline, I realized that there were not any faculty members who looked like me. Um, so if you don't have people who really look like you doing this work, how can you really address the questions that matter to your community? Um, so that's the reason why I do what I do. I care about my community. I care about my people. And I love science. I love the ability to be able to ask questions and answer and in the investigation processes. And not just really being at the interface of chemistry and biology where I use really cool analytical, sophisticated analytical tools to really address um, the biological, um, physiological outcomes. I also do a lot of work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I learned that, you know, we really can't depend on anyone else to tell our stories but ourselves, and we can use our own experiences to make it better for the next generation. So within the DNI world, I've started doing a lot of um, diversity writing where I'm talking about the best ways to train um, some to train um, undergraduate students because I was just one of those students who went through the process or these are the things pitfalls to avoid or these are the things you should do. Every student is supposed to be mentored um, uh, um, organically, everyone has a specific way of being mentored. You cannot have a universal form formula to mentor every student. So taking my own experiences, I've started doing that now. So the generation behind me can have a easier, you know, we want to make the path easier. It's going to be hard work, but if I can do anything to help the people who will be training the next generation, that's what I'm trying to do. And I also believe that I have an ordained purpose to really shine my light and be a light barrier and to motivate and encourage, and especially students who are pursuing this path, because this path is not easy, but it's so beneficial, especially if you have a love for what you do and a passion for what you do. Um, so that's my purpose, because if I I made it from rural Mississippi all the way to Princeton. Anyone else can make it. So, yeah. So before while um, before I end, I want to share seven lessons of my. Before I go into that, I will mention the Hannah Gray Fellowship and a Burroughs Welcome Fund Fellowship. So basically, from the work that I've done as an undergraduate and a graduate student. Um, going into my postdoc, these private institutions have already invested over close to $2 million with me. So I have almost $2 million behind my name to pursue any science that I wanna pursue as I go into faculty positions. And within the, Hannah, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in the Hannah Gray Fellows Program, I am the only HBCU uh, representative, um, HBCU graduate who is represented as one of the Hannah Gray Fellow Program. Fellows, but I know that because of the work I've done over these last years, they are going to be more interested in finding those students who have graduated from HBCU. So never doubt where you're from. And that goes into my first lesson from my livid experiences. We can never doubt what our faith knows. We have to believe in our purpose and know that a door is not going to open in front of us for no reason. We are not where everywhere we where we are where we are at every single point in time for a reason. So if you are got admitted to grad school, never doubt that you're not there because you deserve to be there. If you were admitted, if life brought you into grad school or into a professional program, you are meant to be in that space. So never doubt what you already know or what your faith knows. But with that, the second thing that I learned over this life, uh, faith without work is dead. We can do all, we, have, we, can, we can believe and know that we're where we're supposed to be, but we have to do the work. So always believe in yourself and always back that work up. And to go into my third point, always allow the work you do to speak for you. Over the last 10 years of my life, I learned that the most where I can talk all day and sometimes people listen, sometimes not. But when you do the work, people have to um, acknowledge what you're doing and why you're sitting at the table. Fourthly, whenever you get the stage, always perform and take advantage, full advantage of every single opportunity. You never know who you're meeting. You never know who you're talking with. You never know who you're doing research with on these internship programs. Take advantage of every opportunity. 
Um, next, rejection is sometimes protection and redirection for what's meant. A delay is never a denial. So when you get rejected from something, it could be protection. Train your mind to look at these things in the positive light. Um, next, choose peace. Know how to find your peace. Peace is a state of being. And when you're able to find that peace that surpasses all understanding, any hardship, any difficulty, you will be able to overcome those things. And lastly, always remember that rest is a weapon. When you enter professional schools, graduate schools, and working towards your higher degrees, take a day to rest. When we are drained, when we are tired, that's when our guard comes down and things that we're not looking forward to happen will happen. So always remember, rest is a weapon. And thank you all again for allowing me to share my livid experiences and I look forward to addressing any questions. Thank you very much Dr. McReynolds. Um, I'd like to bring Dr. Churchwell and Dr. Matthews Juarez um, on the screen for our question and answer and I'd like to go back uh, to you Dr. McReynolds. How did your academic training in biochemistry and microbiology and molecular biology lead you to your interest in metabolic decline and aging? That's a really good question. So I would say I always had a love for chemistry and math. So my foundation is in chemistry, but I realized that it was those biological questions that intrigued me the most or understanding disease. So with, so my educational background in undergrad was per chemistry, but all of the internships I did were more biomedical related. So when I did my master's within an all point state, Penn State, the Bridges to the doctorate program, I did a master's in biology because I wasn't, I never really had a biology course. I was straight chemistry and physics to catch up on all of the biology and to tie in, you know, to tie those loose ends. But I felt like the BMEB program at Penn State, the biochemistry, molecular biology and microbiology was the most comprehensive where I could, where, you know, where my chemi my chemical background will be appreciated and I could learn how to think and maneuver like a biologist. And so now I'm able to use these sophisticated chemical tools and address these biological questions. So I have a really, really, um, interesting niche at a critical time in history where not that many people have this skill set. So, I mean, I, look, I think I look at it as destiny. Um, 15 years ago when I was majoring in chemistry and beginning this, I didn't, I knew I would be here, but I didn't see that I would be here, but I'm happy that I had that background and training. So I think you mentioned some, some of the areas that Dr. Hentz and, and others that have talked about, uh, sometimes you have to encourage yourself. And if you yes. look around and there's no one that who looks like you, remember that you're there. Um, Dr. Churchwell, uh, your concerns around minorities and women in engineering, and can you just speak to us very briefly about your pre-health pathway in the medicine and the Black Male Initiative? Tell us something about that program. Yeah, so, well, there are a couple of things going off. You know, if you talk about my path, my path was knowing that look at your strengths or math. Math and science were my strengths, so that's why I went down the but, but I was looking at it to apply to, towards healthcare kind of in a more direct way than, than just purely becoming a PhD in, in biomedical engineering. So that led me down the healthcare path. Look at your strengths. I'm a very personable person. I'm really connected. Wanted to get to know people in a, in a more uh, personal way. So that connects the engineering, medicine, and the interest to be kind of uh, much more in, in the care delivery side. Now, the other part that we involved, I thought you were referring to the, the National Academy of Sciences is involved in building a program currently called uh, looking at uh, black men and women in STEM and the recognition uh, of all of us that are in the round table up there in the National Academy recognizing there's a falling number, stagnating number of women, but falling number of African-American men that are in STEM, whether it be science, engineering, technology, uh, medicine or the like. And so uh, there's been a, a fairly aggressive uh, approach, thank goodness, with the National Academy to bring a bunch of us thought leaders together and scientists and engineers to look at ways to address it. And so a number of action groups are in play around racism, its role, about looking at education, as the doctor here talked about, and a host of other uh, topics are being looked at and addressed, and books are being written in white papers that hopefully people can apply. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Horton mentioned earlier, and I um, want to be sure that we mentioned this, we're, we're at September the 17th, 
things are very different September the 17th than they were March the 17th. And Dr. Horton, thank you for reminding us that we need to put our compassion hat back on because we never know what other people are going through. So just we remind ourselves each other about the human characteristic. Dr. Matthews Juarez, did yes. you have any questions of Dr. Churchwell or, or Dr. McWells? I do. Uh, Dr. Churchwell and I have uh, come to know each other really, really well, really, really fast. And uh, I just love the way in which he has put in perspective. Uh, it doesn't matter where you come from. And Dr. McReynolds says it too. It's where you have purpose and where you're going. The other thing that I would uh, have Dr. Churchwell talk about is how he has used art to focus his medicine and his engineering and focus his love for himself to, to give some self-protection as he went through these uh, difficult, uh, strenuous uh, paces that you could see from the moment he, probably that he was born and to where he is now. He hasn't slowed down. Uh -huh. And so if he could speak to yeah. uh, how we must do self-care, how we use art, how we use the things that are important as we take our journey towards this uh, tremendous work. And then I'll come back to Dr. Reynolds. Absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Reynolds. You know, so art allows a number of things for me. It, it is an escape. Uh, if you were if you were in my office, you would see that I have a sketchbook always at hand. And so the sketchbook, I didn't do any sketching while you were talking, Dr. McReynolds. I was paying attention to you. But when I have a real boring speaker, I get, create a very finished drawing. You can imagine, uh, I didn't have any drawings going on. She was, I was really, I was riveted by her comments there. And but in that sketchbook, I, I follow, try to follow Leonardo da Vinci. Right next to that drawing might be some ideas on my next talk like the points I wanted to make here, you'd see next to the drawing, maybe three or four things I wanted to put in bullet points. And the next page might be a project I'm working on to try to advance the work we're doing the National Academy of Sciences. You flip the page as a drawing, maybe a Superman lifting the world or something. So I intertwine these things because first off, there is that rest that Dr. McReynolds, I find transiently in a few minutes, my brain is someplace else. It's someplace in the Marvel universe maybe, or it's someplace in Italy or someplace maybe in the Vatican is I remember something I saw and I'm sketching. Mm -hmm. And then when I come back, there is, there is amazing. Just in that moment, there is a certain refreshing aspect of that that allows me to come back into the moment in the reality and have a new thought or a different thought. So I really recommend finding that it, those things that, 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 that are in your creative space. Everyone has it. Or finding something that actually juices your creative space, maybe jogging. Maybe it's weightlifting. Maybe it's lifting, listening to Marvin Gaye at 11 o'clock at night. Whatever that might, might turn out to be, it's really important as part of our life journeys to find those things that bring us peace, that give us moments of grace, moments of rest, but also can inform what I call your day job, too. Yeah, yeah. That's an excellent uh, segue. I think that what uh, is exciting about this session is the issue of heart, the issue of compassion. And I think that for the African-American journey, uh, the idea of spirituality is very important, which is what Dr. Matt Reynolds introduced. And she took her daily life and she used um, a process of of, of, of spirituality to take us through what she came to. And for the connection between you, Dr. Churchwell and Dr. Mac Reynolds is so slender that it's paper thin, you can see through it. And so both of you speak to our hearts and speak to what we talked about in the last session, which is compassion, nurturing, caring. One doesn't get what one is going unless they have someone who cares about them, whether it's someone who starts out as your mentor, uh, who is your mom or your dad, or someone who is much more different than you would ever imagine. So 
Dr. McReynolds, as you sit here talking to us, how would you say to someone who is a student at a HBCU living in Mississippi or Tennessee and, and not great circumstances, but circumstances that are challenging. You may have a baby, you may have fathered a baby, but your dreams are to become an engineer, to be a doctor, uh, to be uh, a combination of both. What would you say you that person should do? I would first say that um, not to be afraid to just step out on faith and chase what they desire to do. Don't let anything hold them back. And nothing will ever be too hard that they won't be able to carry. And someone mentioned in the first session how it takes a village. So a lot of times in graduate and professional communities, there is a there is a group of graduate students, a group of medical students, dentistry students, um, who all come together, you know, study together, have families together, etc. So even if you have say children, responsibilities, you will find that support there. So I would, um, my advice would be don't allow the current circumstances to stop you from what you want to pursue and just to go out and, and step out on faith and do that. Excellent. We have six minutes left in this session and if we could, Dr. Matthews Juarez, this was a question um, just leading into something you spoke to Dr. McReynolds about. Um, and that was, would you advocate students to attend an HBCU to undergrad to obtain the undergraduate degrees in STEM and engineering over schools like Georgia Tech, Clemson, University of Tennessee? And do you believe that that gave you an edge over other candidates who were applying for your fellowships? That's a really good question. Good question. Good question. Um, so I, I, I'm one of the, I do not participate in the PWI versus HBCU debate. I believe for each student, you have to go where it's best for you. But I would say, I think it's a great advantage to go to an HBCU because in my experiences, when these institutions are looking to recruit students, they go to the HBCUs to recruit students for various internship programs, graduate school programs, they're making those um, connections, et cetera. And it's, but you wanna make sure you go to the best school for the program. You don't wanna go to a school that's not going to give you the rigor education and think you're gonna make it far. You wanna go to the best place that's going to give you that curriculum or that even when you go, you take advantage of what they're offering. And even for the students who wanna pursue, um, who go to PWIs, I believe they do just as well too, but um, in my experience, I've seen that a lot of the students who really, I don't know, I don't want to say that. I've seen students from both PWIs and HBCUs do tremendously well. And I really do think it's just that personal, um, that personal touch you have. Your they love to call it grit. Um, I just think that's just who we are, but that's the quote unquote word that is used for it. Um, Sometimes I think when you go to an HBCU, you understand how to maneuver so many interesting landscapes. So when you get to a PWI, nothing bothers you because you don't went through so much before, et cetera. Um, but I've seen, I mean, I've seen, I have friends that went to both and people do well on each side of things. It's really about what you do wherever you go. So I don't think that, I don't know if that answered the question. But yeah. Just, we have two minutes left in the session. Um, and we want to toss this to, uh, and. We have one question in the chat room, Doc, in the, Dr. Church World, but we're going to try to phrase it so that you can answer that. Um, in one of your YouTube videos, you discuss the importance of character. Yes. Would you please elaborate on that? Yes. You know, it's interesting. I we're uh, as being vice chancellor of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion at Vanderbilt and in a PWI. Uh, you know, we're seeing, and whether it be HBCU or others, we're seeing kids coming back to campus, uh, and you see these pictures of folks partying and so forth, and they're acting like it's, you know, 1999, literally, the old song, and not having in any way any understanding or reaction or responding to the current climate, the climate of COVID and this highly infectious virus. And so it dawned on me that maybe what they need is to go through a process of a character analysis or character filter. The kind of thing my dad put me through. He said, when you step out of this house, I'm, you probably heard the same story here. 
uh, Doc and 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 uh, Doc McGrady, when you you're representing me when you leave this house, <laughs> so I want you to be use temperance, courage, wisdom, reverence, okay, and build a uh, a character around emotionally intelligent, important things like self awareness and empathy. Now. I'll just tell you, I don't have a, there are not many parents like Robert Churchwell and Mary Churchwell or like Dr. McReady's parents that imbue that, embed that, inculcate that into you so that when you walk out of the house, you do recognize that there's a COVID pandemic and you act responsibly. And so that was what that was about. And, you know, Benjamin E. Mays is my best example. You go to Morehouse College in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and you had this amazing gentleman who molded these young men into the great and into the great leaders that they are, but it was all about character. It was not about him teaching science and math. It was about trying to convey the kind of character traits that Morehouse men or great leaders should have. And Dr. Churchwell, that was the other question in the chat room that we didn't get a chance to ask you was about reading in your father's library, but I think you answered it in the answer to that question. Um, we have about 30 seconds. Dr. Matthew Juarez, is there, you'd like to have uh, something in these last 30 seconds before we go yes. to the session? Thank, thank you, Mr. Payne. I would like to uh, announce that in March, uh, Dr. Churchwell will be heading, uh, spearheading a group called Black Men in White Coats. Uh, and this is an initiative to, uh, to encourage uh, black young men to go into the sciences and into, into medicine. And more will be coming out on that from Dr. Churchwell. I just wanted to give him a nod because he is organizing that. Yeah. Well, to our attendees, please stay tuned for general session three, our roundtable discussion on the value proposition of engineering focused programs and curriculum. I'm Kermit Payne. Thank you very much for joining us. Ms. Jackson? Yes, we are ready. Yes, ma'am. All right, good afternoon. That, that was such an amazing panel, um, the two before us. I just wanna congratulate everyone and thank everyone that has um, chosen to spend their afternoon um, with all of us today. It's been amazing. My name is Daphne Bryson Jackson and I have the pleasure of serving as the next moderator um, for general session three. Um, the discussion today will be the value proposition of engineering focused programs and curriculum. And so what we will do in the next 30 minutes or so is continue down the path that I think has already been started today. I think we've heard from some really amazing and amazingly bright um, professionals that are working in so many different fields in, in engineering and in medicine. Um, but I think the common theme that we're seeing in all of it is, you know, it's hard work, it's believing in yourself, it's having a plan and it's working it. Um, and so I hope that the young people that are out there today are really taking full advantage of, um, of all of the wisdom that's being shared with them and all of the energy and all of the resources that are available to them um, as they begin to define and, de and decide what's next for them um, in their careers. And so today we are excited to have with us two uh, esteemed gentlemen who are going to share with you, um, you know, their story, how they have gotten to where they are today um, and what their role in the engineering world is. And so first I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Sutton. Michael is the president and chief executive officer and majority owner of Infrastructure Engineering Inc, IEI which is a diverse multidisciplinary consulting firm that focuses on the delivery of design engineering, program management, and construction engineering and inspection services. Mr. Sutton has over 40 years of experience with the study, design, and construction of roads, bridges, transit, utilities, parks, and other civil structures. 
He is the founder of Infrastructure Engineering Foundation, the philanthropic arm of IEI, as well as the Council of Black Architecture and Engineering Companies, CBAEC. Mr. Sutton is a graduate of Northwestern University and he holds PE licenses in several states. We will welcome Mr. Sutton in a second. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Keith Hargrove. Dr. Hargrove currently serves as a Dean of the College of Engineering at Tennessee State University. He previously served as chairperson of the Department of Industrial Manufacturing and Information Engineering in the Clarence Mitchell Jr. School of Engineering at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Hargrove received his BS in Mechanical Engineering from Tennessee State University, his MS from the Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla, Missouri, and his PhD from the University of Iowa as a CIC, which is Committee on Institutional Cooperation Fellow. Dr. Hargrove was a Boeing Wellable Faculty Fellow in 2008 and a Harvard Fellow for 2005 and 2006 with the Division of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. He served as assistant to the Dean and Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Tuskegee University. Dr. Hargrove has conducted research projects with Swarovski Aircraft, Boeing, the United States Navy, NASA, and the United States Army in systems engineering, design, cybersecurity, and manufacturing. He is a certified manufacturing engineer, an associate member of the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, Institute of Industrial Engineers, ASEE, and the Tennessee Society of Professional Engineers. So it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Michael Sutton and Dr. Keith Hargrove to share their presentations. Michael? Mute. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my name is Michael Sutton, president of Infrastructure Engineering, and um, really happy to be here today. Uh, you know, this, uh, I listened to all the presentations and uh, the uh, presenters and panelists uh, is, is just outstanding. And uh, I'm very, uh, how, can, how can I say, I, I'm very grateful to be part of uh, this presentation. Uh, again, my journey into engineering uh, began uh, when I was a child. Um, let me see. Um, and would you uh, move on to the next slide, please? Uh, you see that little boy up there in that picture? Um, I went to Carver Elementary School. Uh, I, I believe I was in about the third or fourth grade when two black architects attended my elementary school. I didn't know anything about architecture. Um, and they presented, they showed us plans, they showed us a model of, of a house or something. And, you know, I was just sitting in the back of my class, just, you know, taking it all in. And that day, I said to myself, I want to become an architect. And, um, and the way my life unfolded was, um, well, you know, when I was a kid, uh, even before they came to the school, uh, I remember when I was a little boy, my mom bought me Tonka trucks and I, you know, uh, toy bulldozers and I'm sitting in the play lot and with the sand and the dirt and I'm playing with my toys. And, and I love that, right? And, and I still love that today. So, so that's how my, I guess you can say the seed was planted in me from those two black architects. And they may not even know today that they touched a young boy in an elementary school that has gone on to become an engineer. So, um, so next slide, please. Um, I, I guess I can tell you a little bit about my high school background too before I get into uh, my transition to civil engineering. Um, in high school, um, I, I went to a, I'm from Chicago, from the south side of Chicago. I grew up in public housing. Um, and, and so in high school, I had to take a test to go to this selective school. And uh, <clears throat> 
I found out that I was uh, selected to go to the school and my mother, I, I really didn't even want to go because it was so far from my house. It was like a two hour commute from my house. I had to get on the bus like at, you know, to just be at my eight o'clock class. I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning, get on the bus at six. But um, so I got enrolled in this uh, Limbloom Technical High School. And um, my major in high school was uh, architecture, drafting, and design. And um, so uh, now, you know, I'm going to tell you some other stories. You don't have to be perfect. Uh, I don't think I was the brightest student. I do not think I was um, the best student overall in high school. Um, I was a father at 16 years old. Uh, my daughter was born in April. I made 17 in June. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but that was also a wake up call for me, um, having a kid in high school because uh, my mom, she said, uh, you know, I went to her and I said, what am I, what am I going to do? She said, I want you to be a man. And, and of course I didn't really un fully understand what that mean. Uh, I couldn't even take care of myself less than anybody else. But, uh, but then uh, I really got my act together, right? I said, okay, I got to take care of somebody else. Um, I need to um, uh, get a job. I need to make some money. Uh, and so I really, really got serious about school, about my grades. And uh, I did very well on the SAT test um, and, um, and the ACT test. I don't even know what my grade point average was in high school. Um, and um, I applied to three high, I, I applied to three colleges and um, I got accepted at all three of them. And the one that I really wanted to go to was Northwestern University. And um, I, when I went to, I had to go to them to interview. They wanted to interview me and so I went up there and um, I say, do you have a architectural school? Because I didn't, I didn't do any research about did these schools have architectural departments and all. I was not that sophisticated, right? So when I went up to Northwestern, they say, no, we don't have an architecture school. I say, okay, what is the closest thing you have to architecture? And they said, engineering. I said, sign me up. So I signed up. I struggled. I really, really struggled in college. And, uh, and my grade point average when I graduated from college uh, was like, I needed a 2.0 to graduate. I, my grade point average was 2.10. So do you have to be perfect? No. Uh, do you have to have a willingness to work? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I did when I was in college was I knew it was going to be difficult. Um, I went to the library every night after I had dinner in the student hall. Uh, I would go straight to the library from 6 to 12 o'clock at night. And that was, uh, I guess you can say that was my pattern for um, Monday through Thursday. I didn't go on Friday because, you know, that's when I, my friends and I were together. And um, so anyway, um, I see um, Daphne, I, I, so, so let me move on to the next slide or, <laughs> um, so, so anyway, uh, so that was my transition to civil engineering. So next slide, please. <laughs> uh, these are all the things that you do in transportation, uh, in civil engineering. Uh, I'm a transportation engineer. And so these are some of the wonderful projects, the, the bridges, the roadways, the tunnels, 
the uh, intersections. Uh, I've worked on just about all these projects to uh, one extent to another. So, um, and then again, in transportation engineering, what, what do you consider doing design? Speed, safety, congestion, site distance, rainwater, loads, forces, access. So uh, next slide, please. Um, creating work, wealth, uh, becoming a, um, again, uh, when I was in college, um, I used to read the Black Enterprise magazine from cover to cover. I used to read the advertisements and all the stories and everything. And um, I pretty much knew that uh, if I really wanted to become wealthy, uh, that avenue would be in business. So, um, so, so I had that understanding, uh, but uh, you don't have to exactly own a business to, to become wealthy. You could become what they call an entrepreneur within a company. And, uh, and, and what I would say, if you're working for a company, then uh, the things that you want, you want a good salary, excellent salary, you want great bonuses and you want stock options. Uh, and, and that is the way that uh, you create wealth working. Uh, of course, uh, you gotta take, calculate the risk in all that you do. Um, next slide, all right. Uh, transition to ownership. Acquired firm in 1997, started with two employees, rebranded name to infrastructure engineering, grew from two to two, 100 employees, uh, have multiple offices in Chicago, Indianapolis, Peoria, and New York. And uh, we're also about to open up office in the, uh, Detroit, uh, 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 New Jersey, and also LA. Uh, won a lot of high uh, profile projects. We recently won a project in New York, um, where I, a $30 million project, um, where, where we're the prime consultants, we're the lead consultant on it. Other projects that we worked on is Maggie Daly Park, Chicago Riverwalk, Jackson Park improvements, and what the Obama Presidential Centers. My firm is the lead um, transportation firm for all the roadways around the Obama Presidential Center. It's a really nice project. Uh, the construction value of that project that we're doing is about $150 million. Next slide, please. Um, let me see. Uh, our corporate office, uh, one South Walker Drive, which is in Chicago, is the building with uh, you know the nice little shiny things on it. Those two little shiny stars. Uh, what you see here on this slide is uh, our core values: integrity, excellence, and innovation. And uh, and so this is our uh, so next slide, please. Uh, I I philanthropy. Uh, let me see. Um, I believe in giving back. Um, um, again, I started off, uh, I, I, I know what being poor is like and not having enough resources is like. Uh, so we, we, I'm very generous in what we give back. Matter of fact, I'm even criticized sometimes by even some of my uh, other owners and people within the company and all that type of stuff. But I believe in helping others because uh, that is how I made it. People have helped me and people are still helping me. Uh, some of the things that we do, scholarship, internships, local school outreach, food pantries, uh, social services, social justice, COVID relief, AEC industry, philanth philanthropic endeavors. Next slide, please. Why consider uh, civil engineering? We help others lead healthier and safer lives. We do both uh, work indoors, inside and outside office work. If you excel in math and science classes, you should consider engineering. Uh, job security, engineers are always needed. I always need it. I've never been unemployed, um, only by choice. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, it's awesome. I love civil engineering. I love being an engineer. Uh, how much do civil engineers make? It depends on the field, but uh, for civil engineering, Entry level start at 65,000 to 75,000. Middle management is 100 plus. Experienced professionals is 100 plus. Executives make 150,000 plus. Uh, bonuses varies and stock options. I give you an idea. Uh, use your imagination. So, um, again, I wrote a book in which I uh, copyrighted 
um, is called Imagination, the Key to a Better Future. Uh, what my advice to you is love what you do, uh, strive for excellence, uh, take pride in your work, and stand firm in who you are in your heritage and community. And last but not least, uh, actor uh, Chadwick Boseman, uh, he recently passed and uh, you know, uh, the movie, um, um, Black Panther, uh, even excited my imagination, but he says, when you are deciding on your next steps, next jobs, next careers, you should rather find purpose than a job or a career. Purpose crosses disciplines. Purpose is the essential element of you. It is the reason you are on the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was, that was awesome. I, um, I'm hoping that people are putting their questions for you uh, in the chat room. And um, I would like to now turn it over to Dr. Hargrove uh, for his presentation. Keith. Okay. All right, so, oh, there's Keith. You're up, buddy. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for that introduction and also a special uh, acknowledgement to uh, the presentation by uh, Mr. Sutton. That uh, I want to say to you, sir, I am really, really uh, uh, appreciative of sharing your story of, uh, with the challenges that you face uh, as a teenager and, and now uh, owner and entrepreneur of a, of a major engineering company. So uh, kudos to you, sir. Highest admiration, certainly a fantastic role model. So I want to say welcome to everyone. I too have been uh, uh, really encouraged by the past uh, presentations from Dr. Churchwell and others, Ms. Horton, Dr. Horton and others about uh, as we promote uh, the message about the need and desire to uh, increase the number of underrepresented groups in science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, I serve as Dean of a College of Engineering uh, here at Tennessee State University. And there are about 350 or so engineering programs across the country. And, and within those colleges, uh, at those institutions is where you can pursue a, a degree in one of, I think about 17 different engineering disciplines. Um, Mr. Sutton uh, went to an outstanding university, Northwestern University, uh, and, and did focus in architecture and civil engineering. And that's just one of many different programs that one can pursue. Civil engineering actually is, is the first engineering, recognized as the first engineering program. And so uh, the theme has also been about, you know, how do you become a, an engineer? And so very quickly, even for myself, um, my intentions as a, as, a, as a young teenager, believe it or not, was nowhere near about becoming an engineer. In fact, I wanted to become an attorney uh, God rest his soul. My goal was to become the next Johnny Cochran. Uh, but uh, when I got to college and, and did uh, pretty well in, in mathematics in terms of testing uh, in the early 80s, uh, the, the, the career focus there was engineering is the career of the future. So I changed from pre-law, went into mechanical engineering and been very blessed ever since. But I will tell you also as I reflect back on my own experience, and I say to, to the many students that are on the, uh, on the call, as well as professionals, uh, you know, there, there, there is this myth that to become an engineer, uh, certainly in, in the circles today, that you have to be brilliant in math, a whiz in math, right? and just absolutely love chemistry and physics. And, and all that is good if you do. Uh, certainly that's, that, that, that reinforces a, a passion for that. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that, no, you don't have to be 
brilliant in math. You don't have to be a whiz in mathematics to do that because I wasn't. In fact, if I told you what my ACT score was, uh, you would be shocked uh, by being in the teens. Uh, but you know that wasn't a reflection of my desire to learn. Uh, that wasn't a reflection of my discipline and my effort. And so, uh, you know, five degrees later, including uh, going to Harvard University, uh, I didn't let a low ACT score uh, be an obstacle in terms of what I was capable of by attending Tennessee State University and HBCU and, and, and basically un unleashing an unknown potential uh, that I have within myself. And that experience here allowed me to do that. And so I've, what I say to a lot of high school students and even my own students in my college uh, that, uh, you know, making, put in the time, effort, and discipline uh, uh, in your particular program, uh, you can succeed in getting your engineering degree. And so I continue to promote that uh, even in my role as Dean of Engineering, when I'm recruiting to, to my 900 plus students in the engineering programs here in the College of Engin Engineering at Tennessee State University, that becoming an engineer is more about discipline. It's also about putting the effort and being committed and dedicated as well. So let me just say with regard to a backdrop of, of, of the profession of engineering. And, and, and you've had some, some uh, uh, presentation about, you know, what is, what is engineer and kind of how you can become an engineer. So currently the United States produces about 140,000 engineers per year. That's nationally. Uh, however, I would say that the demand for engineering in terms of occupations and, and jobs is probably around 250,000 a year. So therefore, obviously, obviously you see there's a supply demand factor right there, uh, even with the production of 130, 440,000 engineers per year, the, the, the number of jobs that are available far exceeds that. So that makes it a great opportunity uh, to pursue uh, any of the degrees in engineering, but basically STEM in general. In fact, uh, when you rank the top 10 best jobs in the US, the top 10 jobs, the top 10 best jobs, seven of them, seven of them are in the STEM area. Uh, whether it's engineering, whether it may be even nursing, uh, whether it be a computer analyst, seven of the top 10 are in the STEM discipline. And so let me just say, uh, make a couple comments on the pathway uh, to becoming an engineer. So we have some students that are on the call and they may be majoring in physics, they may be majoring in biology, and certainly there are some those that are in, engine, uh, in engineering. And even all those disciplines, they too can end up working in an engineering or technical environment. And so one pathway, obviously, is you, you go to college, you choose your major, get a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, Mechanical Engineering. Another pathway is you may go to a community college and, and, and take two years of a pre-engineering program and then transfer to a four-year college uh, and complete a engineering degree in one of those disciplines. So that's also possible. And so in addition to that, uh, even if you are a currently a biology or physics, physics major or chemistry major, and you're pursuing that bachelor's degree, you may be also still interested in engineering and may get a degree in engineering at the graduate level, of course, taking some undergraduate courses as a foundation, but it's still possible that you can get an advanced degree in the engineering field. I mentioned that in terms of pathways uh, because of the consortium that is hosting this conference uh, currently has uh, established a MOU, a Memorandum of, of Understanding, 
with four outstanding liberal arts programs. Uh, and those institutions are Payne College, Fisk University, um, uh, uh, Lemoyne Owen, uh, well, Payne Fisk, Lane College, and Lemoyne Owen. And this is led by Meharry Medical College. And so students that are at these outstanding liberal arts uh, uh, colleges, uh, as they pursue a STEM related degree, such as chemistry, biology, or, or, or physics, uh, we currently have implemented a joint partnership, Tennessee State University and the College of Engineering with these four outstanding institutions. And so you have an opportunity if you are a student at any of those four schools that you can also uh, take and enroll in, in courses at Tennessee State and pursue an engineering degree. And so that option is available for students at those schools and there is some financial support to elect for that as well. And so for the engineering programs that are within the College of Engineering at Tennessee State University, all four of the liberal arts uh, colleges have an opportunity to pursue a degree in engineering as well as, as well as satisfy the requirements to obtain your chemistry, your biology, or physics degree as well. So a lot of credit goes uh, to uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the consortium uh, for, for, for this, this project. And we're excited about initiating that uh, project uh, this, this academic year. And, and we seek to uh, recruit and look for students who are part of that. And so let me end on the note that uh, as we promote the, the need to uh, increase more minority students in, in the discipline, uh, only about 4.3% of those that graduate in engineering or are African-Americans, the desire to increase, increase more is gonna require a collective effort of all of us. Uh, this MISSIP grant is fantastic, but all, hands on deck as we do more and more to produce graduates in this field of engineering and STEM in general. And so that, on that note, uh, thank you so much uh, for listening and look forward to answering some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hargrove. Um, again, to you and to uh, Mr. Sutton, um, you both have such been such inspirations. I think your words um, speak volumes. I think um, you shared a lot that um, I think good food for thought and, uh, and I'm big on, on words. And so I picked up two words that I wanna just kind of repeat to the young people that are listening. Um, Mr. Sutton talked about help and he, you know, for him to get to where he is today, someone helped him and he certainly is paying it back and paying it forward by helping others. Um, and, and with you, Dr. Hargrove, your word was options. And I think that young people need to understand how many amazing options exist in these fields that we're talking about. And shame on them. I wish I were young today. I wish I were coming along now. <laughs> because I tell you, it's amazing the world that is wide open to, to all of these young people. And so thank you to both of you. Um, let's start taking some questions. Um, I see we have one in our chat room, uh, Mr. Sutton, it's for you. It says, are there opportunities for internships with your company? If so, how do uh, people contact you or how do they apply? Yes, uh, yes, there are opportunities for internships uh, uh, within our company. And uh, the way to apply, I would say, uh, visit our website, uh, www.infrastructure-eng.com and uh, you can apply through the website or, or you can contact me personally. My email address is msutton at infrastructure-eng.com. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions in our chat room. Um, so I'm gonna ask a couple that I had and um, if anyone else wants to chime in, please type them into the chat room. Um, so one of my questions is, um, and, and since both of you are coming, you know, in this space really from different lanes, 
what are the trends you're seeing today that, that you think will drive, you know, the engineering and STEM communities in the next five years? Uh, uh, you want to take that one? Take yeah, yeah I, I'll make a couple of comments. So, so uh, you know, obviously uh, the trends in emerging technologies, whether it's uh, uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, you know, these, these technologies is, is expanding the industry as well as different occupations. You know, someone said that, you know, about 50% of the jobs today, uh, uh, you know, may not, may not exist in the next 50 years and different roles, different positions will be, be developed. And so uh, from, from a trend standpoint, uh, you know, I, I, I predict that STEM jobs will continue to expand, which implies that uh, not everyone has to become uh, an engineer. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people that are graduating with engineering degrees that are not necessarily doing engineering jobs. You, uh, you can have an engineering degree and work in computers, whether it's programming or uh, you know, computational or quantum computing and a lot of, of other areas. And so the three trends that I see uh, is one, how, how IT and data science and analytics is transforming every industry that you can think of. Number two, uh, the jobs that are, are opening right now uh, are, uh, are in some way or shape or form uh, involves cyber security in a number of ways in, in with regard to how you protect information. And then third, I would say, how do we get today's youth and, we, and some of the other speakers talked about that. How do we get K-12, promote STEM education, even our colleges and universities working with outstanding engineering companies like with Mr. Sub Sutton? How do we do a better job expanding, promoting, and get a larger pipeline to pursue those degrees? And, and I can give you another perspective. I can't see myself. I, even though I turned, off, turned on the video, I cannot see myself. I don't know uh, what is happening. We see you. Okay, that's good. As long as you can see me, um, I got another perspective too. I was I was uh, not a big proponent of work from home. I'm old school, right? You know, I come up, and uh, COVID nineteen has really, uh, again, I I don't wish for COVID nineteen to ever happen, right? But it has happened. And, and now that it has happened, I'm thinking from an entrepreneur standpoint, I can open up offices any place in the world. People can work from home. I don't have to have expensive office space. I need employees, but I do not have to have offices. Uh, the offices can be home. We're finding that we're working very, very well collaboratively uh, through uh, the technology that exists today. If COVID-19 would have happened 20 years ago, we, we would not have Zoom. We would not have cell phones, right. uh, even computers and stuff. We would not be equipped to, um, to do the things that we're doing today. And so um, in a way, I'm somewhat very excited about the opportunities that has presented itself uh, from this pandemic. And so um, I'm looking at ways how now, uh, how can I leverage this technology in creating a, a regional firm, a national firm, and possibly an international firm? Wow, that's exciting. Um, I'd like to bring in our esteemed uh, leader, uh, Dr. Patricia Matthews Juarez, to see if she has any questions uh, for you two gentlemen. I'm sure she does. I see she's on. I don't see her. Ah, she's coming. 
Yes. Hi, how are you, Dr. Jackson? I am uh, wonderful. A, a very exciting session with uh, Mr. Sutton and Dr. Hargrove. I think that the one question that I would have is that if young uh, uh, students are interested in entrepreneurship and they want it to be innovators, uh, where would they, how would they start their resume? Uh, some of the students may not have uh, created a pathway initially uh, that uh, they were doing robotic uh, uh, building or they were not uh, creating structures and they weren't uh, internship uh, have, they may not have had internships and places of business. What would you say to those students? And this is for both of you. How would they, how would they start? How would they begin to create the pathway towards entrepreneurship and engineering? So, so, very, so very quickly, let me say that uh, at Tennessee State University and many other universities, uh, they have developed entrepreneur clubs and, and, and organizations for engineering students and others uh, who have an entrepreneurial mindset to start businesses. Uh, in fact, uh, we work with the College of Business here at Tennessee State and we host uh, an entrepreneur uh, 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 design event uh, with the College of Business. So the good thing is for, that are, for current students at your respective universities to, to, to make sure that whether it's the College of Business or, or whatever that's on your campus, uh, have a entrepreneur uh, 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 organization that promote you developing a product or delivering a service. And, and then uh, hopefully you can take that uh, commercially, which, you know, everything about doing a business plan and, and finding capital and, and all those things, you can get trained and practice uh, uh, at the particular university. And I think Mr. Sutton it, uh, has excellent background to, you know, how about, you know, once you have the experience, how do you monetize your knowledge and your skills by being an entrepreneur and starting your own company? Yes, thank you. And, and, and I'd just like to say to, to back up Dr. Hargrove is uh, exposure. And, he, and that's exactly what he was talking about is exposure. And, and entrepreneurship is not easy. Um, it's, it's one of the most difficult things I have done. And, and you gotta have a lot of preparation and um, and so uh, I would say, as Dr. Hargrove said, exposure and uh, knowing what you're getting into. And um, so, um, and, and just the desire, you know, um, here I am at the age that I am, and I'm still talking about creating a national firm, international firm, you know, just like Martin Luther King, I have a dream. You know, I, I have a vision, I have goals and, and I just hope that I'm able to achieve, um, I have achieved uh, my goal um, somewhat, but I haven't got to the national firm yet. I haven't got to the international part yet. And so that, that still drives me, you know, that still motivates me. So, so you gotta have something that motivates you, that drives you, that gets you up in the morning, um, and one of the things that get me up in the morning is opportunities and possibilities. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. That's excellent. So we have just a few more minutes remaining and I have one question um, in the Q&A session. It reads, I have heard that there are some medical doctors that have majored during undergrad in non-traditional areas such as English or philosophy and go on to become doctors. Is that possible when you're going on to become an engineer? in an attempt to have a higher, a higher GPA? Well, from, from an from a education standpoint, uh, to become a true engineer requires you to have an engineering degree. So uh, I, I wanna be very clear about that. Uh, in fact, uh, 
being recognized as an engineer like Mr. Sutton, uh, that PE at the end of his name is, is a registered uh, professional engineer, just like a MD uh, with regard to being certified to practice in that field. So for, for those that want to become an engineer, uh, I encourage them to uh, look at engineering programs at different universities uh, and, uh, and, and obtain that degree if the desire is to become a practicing engineer. Uh, Dr. Hargrove, um, when, I, when I think about it, you know, uh, become a doctor, they will accept just about anybody with any type of degree, right? You know, that, in, yeah. in medical school or law school. And, but an engineer, we have to get that engineering degree at the, uh, at the uh, university level, at the bachelor's level, before we can even go to the master's level because of all the prerequisites and stuff that you need, uh, you know, to, to, to become an engineer. So it's really interesting that, you know, um, uh, someone can uh, graduate in English and become a lawyer. Someone can graduate in English and go to med school. But uh, to become an engineer, basically, uh, if you didn't do it in the undergrad, you would have to do so many uh, courses that you would have to take, you know, undergraduate courses before you can even go to the master's program or the PhD program. So it's a different track uh, in a way. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? We, we've got one minute. Well, th th that is true. And, and so just to, 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 to confirm that, to become an engineer requires you to satisfy a engineering curriculum yeah. uh, and, and graduate with, with a degree. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in the industry, there are some people who claim to be engineers, maybe in terms of function, but in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, satisfying the requirements that's necessary. So on behalf of Mr. Sutton, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And thank you for our, our moderator awesome. and the opportunity to be on this, on this uh, conference. It's been my pleasure. I hope everyone has a great rest of the conference. And to Dr. Matthew Suarez, thank you as well for your leadership. Thank you so much. Signing thank off. You. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Good afternoon. We are now entering into our last uh, session. Uh, this promises to be an exciting one. Uh, this is our town hall meeting in which we will uh, start to talk about the issues of today relative to uh, what are the steps for minority students to become an engineer. But before we do that, we would like to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Uh, James E.K. Hildreth, who is uh, our leader. Uh, he calls himself our cheerleader. He is a expert within his own right as, uh, as an infectious disease uh, researcher uh, and innovator and uh, inventor. He is also uh, leading the most important charge this year, uh, at this time, uh, this century uh, for COVID-19, uh, not only for the state of Tennessee, but nationally. Uh, Dr. Uh, James E.K. Hildreth is also uh, the individual who sparked uh, the notion of writing this uh, grant uh, for a, a science minority con uh, consortium uh, when uh, they established the Empower Conference that looked at ways in which we could uh, attract uh, black males into uh, medical schools. And he has uh, done a lot in that regard but what has been very exciting has been his commitment uh, to uh, engineering and to STEM. And we would like to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Hildreth, 
who will now also introduce uh, the other uh, five presidents that are on the call. Uh, we uh, defer at this point to Dr. Hildreth, who will now acknowledge the other uh, presidents from the other schools and talk a little bit about the importance of the memorandum of understanding that we have negotiated as leaders with uh, Tennessee State University, uh, the School of Engineering, uh, under the leadership of Dean Hargrove. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you, Pat. Can you all hear me? So, so first, let me just say welcome. Uh, I'm sorry this has to be virtual, but under the circumstances, I'm just happy we can all get together. Uh, I do want to thank and congratulate Dr. Matthew Juarez for putting together this very important consortium uh, of minority schools for science and STEM. Uh, this is really, really important uh, and I'm really excited about it. I'd also like to acknowledge our neighbor and partner, Fisk University. Meharry and Fisk have a long, long history of, of partnerships and academic programs and training of students. So I'm really excited uh, that we could partner with them uh, in this endeavor. I'd also like to thank the presidents, the faculty and the staff at Payne, Le Moyne, Lane and TSU for their support in helping to make this possible for our students, because that's what this is really all about is empowering our students. Uh, and as always, I'd like to thank those, the, the folks from One Joshua Group who, I used to, who always do a superb job of logistics uh, for these programs. Let me just say that the importance of this consortium lies in the importance of getting minority students interested in and engaged in STEM particularly engineering. Engineers will play a critical role in solving all of the remaining grand challenges faced by the country and by the world. The world population now stands at seven and a half billion, I think. And the questions arise that represent the grand challenges. How are we gonna feed that many people? Uh, the amount of arable land is not increasing. How are we gonna provide them all with clean water? How are we gonna provide energy uh, for their needs? And then how are we gonna design new medicines and technologies to keep them healthy? All of these challenges will in fact be solved by engineers and people in, in STEM professions. And I would argue that we have to have all of the talent available around the world and in this country for sure to solve those problems. And that means that minority students, especially African-Americans, have to be involved in this and we have to find a way, especially to get women involved in, in, these, in, these, uh, in these challenges. And that is why this consortium uh, of schools for STEM and science is so very important. And let me just say to the, to the students who are uh, gonna be a part of this, this is a great opportunity to find mentors, to get your questions answered, to find peers who have similar interests to you, to form support groups, and all of these things will be very important as we move forward. And let me just say, uh, and I mean this most sincerely, watching what is happening in, our and in the world to the students, I hope it's obvious to you <laughs> how much we need you right now. We need your talents. We need your ingenuity. We need your energies. Uh, we just plain need you to be interested in solving these problems. And I think this consortium will help you get ready to do just that. And so with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my, my fellow presidents, and I know they're gonna be having some words to say to the students, but I really do want to, to let all of the students know that Dr. Glover, Dr. Jones, Dr. Johnson Dean, Dr. New Newkirk, Dr. Hampton, all of them are as committed as I am to making you transformed and ready to, to change the world. And so I hope you'll take advantage of their support, my support, and this wonderful consortium that's been put together for you. Uh, because I think with this and with the things that you'll do as you go through your undergraduate studies, you really can change the world. And that is my hope for you. And I'm really excited to be a part of it. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and, and the workshop and the town hall and anything that we can do at Meharry to make this program more impactful, just please let us know. Thank you, Dr. Matthew Juarez.
as thank always. You, Dr. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Okay. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, offer uh, Dr. Hampton, Logan Hampton, an uh, opportunity to say hello. Uh, Dr. Newkirk, uh, a opportunity to say hello as well. Carol Johnson Dean, who is uh, a colleague and a, and a friend of mine uh, at, uh, at uh, Lamont Owen to say hello, as well as Cheryl Evans Jones and Glenda uh, Baskin Glover. So if uh, we can turn on their mic and cameras uh, for a short minute, that would be great in acknowledgement of the MOU. And then we'll come back to Dr. Hargrove. Dr. Matthews Suarez, thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, thanks to the entire consortium for um, this visionary commitment to uh, advancing engineers um, and those potential engineers uh, at Lane College. As I uh, travel about uh, meeting alums, uh, I, from time to time, will run into our alumni who will uh, tell me about a program that used to be at Lane College, where students would begin their studies at uh, Lane College, and then they would complete their engineering studies uh, at uh, TSU. And I have longed since 2014 when I arrived on this campus uh, to have this program available to our students again. And so I am absolutely excited. I'm excited to see uh, the names of my colleagues uh, on the list that are participating uh, in, the, uh, in the forum today. And I'm happy to see uh, my, uh, my colleague presidents uh, who uh, join us on tonight. And many thanks to uh, all of the partners uh, for uh, your leadership and for your vision and commitment in this program. Our students will benefit greatly from it. Thank you. And, and Dr. Hampton, I must say to the group, you were a cheerleader and all the way there when I spoke to you on the phone and uh, uh, when we first got the grant. And so thank you so much. Wow. Okay. Carol Johnson Dean. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Patricia Matthew Suarez. I have to say uh, that Dr. Patricia Patricia and I go back a very long way, having been at Fisk University <laughs> together. And so I'm truly honored to be here uh, with her today because uh, it's really exciting that our journey uh, in education and in this area um, is definitely connecting together once again. Um, I can't really say enough about how important uh, this work is, and I have to really give a great deal of credit to you and also to Dr. Hildreth for the visionary leadership. And um, Meharry has really uh, been a shining star through this very terrific time that we're having with COVID. And it's really been a blessing to uh, particularly the uh, historically black college just to have leadership uh, on this topic as we try to navigate this, uh, this new world. Um, I will say that uh, I'm also honored to work with our vice president President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Sherry Painter, who herself is a STEM professor here at Lemoyne Owen College. And she certainly has been pushing us and pushing us uh, to be involved in these kinds of activities. And we know how important it is when we see the huge number of disparities that exist in so many uh, science and STEM fields across this country and the importance of the future for our young people to be involved, invested, and well-educated. Thank you for opening the doors. I have truly enjoyed all of the comments that were made. And I'm sure that our students really learned a lot from the wonderful uh, leaders, professors, and entrepreneurs that you've had on today. It's really been a blessing. And thank you again so much for having us. Thank you so much for the MOU. We are very excited. As Dr. Hampton said. Thank you so much, Carol. And we look forward to seeing each other again very soon. Carol, Cheryl Evans Jones, is she here with us? She is. Cheryl Evans Jones, would you like to say a few words? Your, your, your uh, mute is on. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I was having some technical problems, so, and I'm sorry. I'm, 
we know that you guys are in a storm down there. It seems to have calmed right now. Are you able to hear me? Yes, and we can see your beautiful face too. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Matthew Juarez, Dr. Hildreth, to my fellow presidents and to all who are assembled here this evening. This is a really exciting opportunity for us as well. We are delighted to be a part of this consortium. Our experience here at Payne was similar to that of Dr. Hampton's. When I joined Payne College about 27 or so years ago, we had a similar agreement. And we are indeed excited and very enthusiastic to be able to offer this opportunity to our students again. We wanna thank those who are responsible, those outside of Payne College, others who participated in the MOU. And I'd also like to especially thank members of the Payne College team, Dr. Martin, our Provost, Vice President of Academic Affairs, as well as the Chair of our Math, Science, and Technology Department, Dr. Raul Peters. But again, we are just excited. We know that this is very important work. STEM disciplines are important to us. They are now and the future. And we are just delighted and look forward to the opportunities that will be afforded to our students in the institution through this consortium. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, now, I don't know you, but I'm gonna to get to know you. Uh, uh, Doctor, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Hans. Uh, Payne was on the Department of Education's mind when we set up this consortium. So we welcome you aboard. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, with, now, Dr. Uh, Berger is here instead of Dr. Newkirk. Uh, Dr. Newkirk is the interim president of FISC. Uh, Dr. Newkirk uh, is uh, away, uh, but Dr. Berger, would you like to say a few words on behalf of FISC? Yes, uh, FISC is delighted to, to be uh, a partner in the Alliance. And I'm bringing greetings from uh, President Newkirk and uh, Provost uh, Jones, uh, who also couldn't uh, be here uh, tonight. So um, we are really committed to transitioning students, preparing them uh, at FISC in the bachelor level, and then transitioning them to advanced degrees. And um, in particular, we have master's degrees in science, in chemistry, biology, uh, and physics, and um, actually to bring some concrete uh, recent examples, two of uh, our students who earned their degree masters at Fisk in Physics, Jonathan Reynolds and Adrian Parker, they both transitioned into PhD in engineering at TSU. So, and they recently graduated uh, uh, around uh, a year ago. So. You know, it's with small numbers that we can address the problem of underrepresentation of uh, African Americans in, in STEM. But uh, these are two examples that we we know we can make uh, uh, an impact, even the small school like uh, this of our size. Uh, sometimes problems can be solved even um, uh, with the small numbers. Uh, if you look at the productivity of uh, PhDs that are awarded to African Americans, uh, this overall via the bridge program um, uh, transitions about 20% of the national output in PhD in physics. Uh, we do that with a network of institutions. I mentioned TSU, but uh, also with Vanderbilt and uh, uh, another 14 other schools that we have created a network um, uh, on the national scale. So uh, we are also interested in transitioning our science students in, into um, BAs in engineering via dual degree. So um, we will be looking into expanding this program. We're very interested in having three years at FISC in a science major, and then uh, two more years in, uh, uh, in engineering. So in five years, they can earn two degrees, one from fixed in science and one from 
the partnering institution in engineering. So uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, talking to uh, partners in this area. Thank you so much, Dr. Berger. Uh, Dr. Glenda Glover uh, will be uh, not on the call, but Dr. Hargrove is. Uh, Dr. Glover was a, a, an initial mover and shaker, uh, and we were uh, very happy to have her. I would like to take this opportunity, if we can put uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hintz on the call. Dr. Hintz, uh, we would like to take this opportunity to present to you uh, officially and formally, uh, the MOU uh, with Mahari as the lead, FIS as our partner with the uh, School of Engineering at Tennessee State with uh, Hampton, uh, Dr. Hampton, who represents Lane College, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, Johnson Dean that represent Lamont Owens College, Dr. Cheryl Evans Jones that represents Payne College, and Dr. Hargraves that represent TSU, and Dr. Berger who represents Newkirk for FIS, the former MOU to establish a uh, dual degree program at, in engineering for these colleges. So we thank you so much and we look forward to uh, our work together. And now I turn this over to Dr. Hargrove. Yes, thank you, Dr. Matthews Juarez. Uh, so, uh, um, so on behalf of Dr. Glenda Glover, uh, we are so excited uh, about this, this partnership. Uh, this is a reflection, uh, I believe, of the leadership of Dr. Glover uh, reaching out to institutions uh, outstanding institutions, outstanding HBCUs uh, to help produce graduates in high need fields. And uh, the institutions that are involved, uh, I have been in some way, shape or form affiliated with them. Uh, Lamoine Owen in my hometown of Memphis, uh, out doing great things. Uh, Dr. Hampton, I visited your institution years ago and, and uh, initiated that, uh, that transfer program with your fine institution. And I would go far as to say, we did have a couple of students who actually transferred uh, to TSU and did receive their degrees. And, and having pain uh, uh, is an outstanding addition. And, and, and Dr. Berger, uh, I served as uh, the advisor for, for uh, Dr. Parker and, and, and Mr. Reynolds uh, as well, uh, coming out of this with that strong physics program that you have there. And so we are just uh, uh, excited about this collaboration to address the need. So I mentioned earlier that there are about 140,000 engineers that are produced per year. Uh, but only about 4.2% of those are of African-American descent. So there's a lot of work to do. And uh, for TSU, and there are about 13, uh, 14 other HBCU engineering programs that produce about a third of the engineering graduates in the US. And so this partnership allows us to increase that number, partnering with outstanding liberal arts institutions and Tennessee State University with, with its accredited College of Engineering and the disciplines that we offer. More so, every student also has an opportunity to still get a degree from their institution, or shall we say their home institution in a STEM discipline as well as pursue and get a degree in, in engineering from Tennessee State University. So those participants will walk out with two degrees uh, to enter the workforce or entrepreneurship or graduate school, well prepared uh, to go into engineering. And so uh, I, I wanna commend the strong support of the presidents of these fine institutions Dr. Glover for her relentless support of the College of Engineering at Tennessee State 
and our outreach and working with uh, liberal arts colleges uh, that are part of this partnership such that we can increase the number of graduates uh, uh, in the field of engineering and, and make a contribution to the uh, workforce here in the US. So thank you so much. And again, uh, we look forward to starting this. Uh, my commitment to the presidents, I plan to visit every one of those schools uh, by, by the end of the academic year and look forward to recruiting students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hargrove. Now we'll move into our 545 program. We're gonna to try to uh, stay on, on task. Uh, we are delighted uh, that uh, we have had such a uh, outstanding uh, uh, session and that uh, we will now uh, defer uh, this, this discussion again to Dr. Hargrove, who will uh, lead the panel with uh, Dr. Paula Lockett, Lockin, Dr. Uh, Valentin Miller, and uh, himself as one of the speakers. Uh, we have a series of questions that uh, the panel will introduce themselves and will then begin to talk about the kinds of questions that and responses that may be driving some of the questions that students may have but are reluctant to ask. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hargrove. So, uh, uh, the, as the title implies, uh, we as uh, uh, professionals, whether we are in academia or industry, uh, are playing our unique roles in promoting STEM and the pursuit of uh, degrees in the profession. And so, uh, 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 myself, as well as the panelists, uh, we would like to uh, entertain questions coming from uh, our audience to learn uh, for those that are interested in not only the profession, but how you get prepared in this profession. Uh, as a potential engineer, what do you do as an engineer uh, to pursue an advanced degree? Uh, where's are so the best places to get a, uh, an advanced degree and what type of funding that you can uh, obtain to get a, an advanced degree. A good example is a program with Fisk and Vanderbilt and Fisk and Tennessee State University, allowing uh, you get a, a master's or a PhD in engineering from partnering schools. Those are the types of relationships in the academic space are, are needed for us to make that uh, increase the, the number of graduates. From an industry standpoint, uh, those companies investing in programs, providing internships, and, as well as uh, eventual permanent employment, those are partners that are needed as well. But I would also add that the MISSIP grant supported by the Department of Education, uh, that's an, an infusion of funds uh, within the academic space uh, to help promote support uh, students that in many cases are uh, financially challenged to continue their studies. And so there's also a government role uh, with regard to our mission in increasing these numbers. So I, I say that all of those things as all the panelists all play un unique roles and I think all of us could, could provide some feedback on how we go about doing that. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, a series of questions uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Pol Pollard Larkin and Dr. Uh, Valentin Miller, uh, feel free to uh, also like Dr. Hargrave uh, chime in. And, and I'm gonna start with, um, First, what is the first step for minority students in approaching a, a career in engineering? Uh, that's the first question. The second question is, what is the importance of mentoring? 
being mentored and seeking out mentor, mentors. And the third question is how do you recommend seeking a mentor? So let's start with those three and we'll start with you, Dr. L uh, Polar Lockin. Hi, I'm Julianne Pollard Larkin, and I'm going to jump right in. If you like science, jump on it right away. What you need to understand is that you need to get those core courses in physics and math, which includes that algebraic math as well as calculus and everything out of the way. Get that tutor if necessary as early as you can and establish your dominance in those core subjects. Once you have that under your feet, if you know that you're interested in becoming an engineer, talk to the other engineering students. See how they're doing. Start to look at what are the different um, degree paths that you can take and then where you can sub-specialize in. Because myself as a physicist, I had to negotiate that path. Secondarily, trying to establish yourself also will require having someone who sees something in you that you don't see in yourself, i.e. the mentor. And then secondarily to that, someone known as an advocate, someone who will speak up for you and get you opportunities that you wouldn't have even thought about for yourself. That is a different kind of mentor. That's a person who puts their own skin in the game to make sure you succeed. The way to find these people is number one, through your instructors. Establish a great relationship and rapport with them through the labs that you have and through relationships that you encounter by actually talking with them during the student and teacher office hours. Beyond that, do research. During the summer, start to do projects with these people so they know you as more than just the one out of 100 students they teach in a large class. Get to know them during the summer internships that you take, and there's things such as research experience for undergrads, REUs, that you should look up right now if you have nothing going on in your life. That will pay you five to $6,000 a summer, so please look into that. Wonderful. How about you, Dr. Valentine Miller, what do you Hi. think? Of, uh, what's your take on those first three questions? Hi, I'm Jamie Valentine Miller, and I think that Julianne really summed it up quite well. Um, you want to prepare yourself by making sure that you've taken all of the appropriate coursework that you need, and you want to make sure that you take advantage of any opportunities that you can find to do research, whether it's on campus, at a nearby campus, or during a summer internship. One thing that you're also going to need is a stockpile of self-confidence. Uh, as other speakers have mentioned, you're going to be a minority in the engineering field. One of the great things that HBCUs do is that they prepare us to go out into that greater world with the confidence and knowledge that we are prepared for any challenges that may come to us. I didn't go to any of your wonderful schools. I started out at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, but I want you to know that most of the PhDs who are African-American got their start at an HBCU. Most of the black judges, most of the black doctors got their starts at an HBCU. So what you wanna do is establish within yourself a fountain of confidence, knowing that the books that you're using in your classes are the same books that they're using at Harvard and Yale and wherever else. So as long as you're studying and you're learning the material, you'll be prepared to go out into the greater world. Wonderful. So I'm going to start with the second set of three questions with you, uh, Dr. Valentine Miller. What is the importance in identifying a role model? What makes a beneficial role model? Why should a high school student consider engineering as a career? And what do they do? And then the last set of questions, how do I succeed and navigate the tough engineer curriculum and college to graduate? Well, you know, I think that role models come in many different shapes and forms. Um, of course, everyone is inspired by Mae Jameson or some of the other famous scientists who are out there, the hidden figures. But sometimes your role model might be your mom who showed you that she worked really hard at everything that she did. It might be a teacher. It might be another person that you've come into contact. It might be someone from your church. So try to, um, what, what I try to do is gain something from all of the interactions that I have. Um, I noticed that with the younger people, they're doing a lot of self-mentoring and I guess like setting role models for themselves. So I see that 
I might see a, a graduate student who's a first year graduate student who is a clear role model to all of the undergraduates who are in our circle. I didn't, I didn't do a full introduction, but I'm the founder of African American Women in Physics Incorporated. And so we help to inspire and to celebrate all of the black women in physics at all different levels. So I see in our group that we have freshmen who are inspired by seniors, seniors who are inspired by graduate students and graduate students who are inspired by professionals and professors. So I think that you should seek role models wherever they are, even if that's someone who's in the class with you. Yes, I'm going to come back and ask you guys to tell us who you are, but I wanted to get these questions out because I think that your stories about who you are uh, really adds to this discussion. So I'm going to ask the last question and then we will open it up to uh, others and general conversation. Uh, and then uh, the last question is, how do I find external support via, uh, by scholarship to com complete my STEM degree? That, let's go back to Dr. Uh, Pollard Lockin and then you last, Dr. Uh, Valentine Miller. <laughs> Say the question one more time. I had a little hiccup and I missed your last statement. How, how do I find external support via scholarship to complete my STEM degree? Oh, for just the undergraduate level or the graduate? Uh, uh, why don't we look at both? Oh. Okay, for undergraduate, hopefully that's already established uh, for where you are right now, but um, you should look at all the things such as like Ford Foundation scholarships, as well as all the other large companies such as AT&T, and that is easily Googleable. But I wanna tell you the secret about why you need to get into STEM this moment. For graduate degrees, master's level, not so much, but for PhD STEM degrees, the actual mentor pays for your education and even covers a cost of living as well. You receive a stipend. You pay to learn and work in their research projects. This is the big difference in the divide between going between STEM versus social sciences. So please keep that in mind as you pursue and decide whether or not you're going to get a high paying eventual STEM career like myself, or if you're gonna try the harder road, but well-traveled social science degree, when in the graduate school um, realm, you most likely have to try to win funding somehow, but it's not guaranteed from your professor. Okay, Dr. Valentine Miller, your response? Yeah, I think that um, as you get further along in undergrad, it does become more of a challenge to secure extra funding. What worked out for me was I was able to do research in a lab on campus and they, I was paid for that. I also did tutoring um, at, of other undergrads and high school students to finish out my senior year in college. Um, but I, I would echo what Julianne said, which is if you go to graduate school in the STEM field that they are gonna pay you, you will not have to pay to go to, to complete your PhD. Um, and I think that was, that was the end of my point. I think that uh, because many of these questions have been uh, discussed today, I think that uh, we, we've just put a fine point on them, but I want to come back and talk about have both uh, you, uh, Dr. Pollard Lockin, and you, Dr. Valentine Miller, talk about who you are. Tell us who you are, your current uh, position, uh, your academic rank, uh, what is it that you're doing uh, as your founder and CEO of, of companies? What is it that uh, has set you apart? So tell us about who you are and then uh, what you think could be a personal journey for others like you. Well, I'll go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I am originally from the city of Philadelphia. Um, I was recruited to FAMU by the alumni there, and I was received a full scholarship, which was sponsored by a national laboratory. So every summer, I had a summer internship that was already taken care of, and they paid me every summer to fly out to California to do research at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Now, if you can imagine being, you know, 17, 18, going to leaving Philly, going to college in Florida, and flying back and forth to California. I grew up in the projects. This was not the life that I had imagined for myself. So right there, I was sold on FAMU and on HBCUs. Um, after I left FAMU, I went to Brown University where I got a master's 
Um, and then I left Brown and I went to Johns Hopkins University where I finished my PhD in physics. I want the students to know that it's never a straight road. There were bumps in the way. There were times when I thought, I'm not gonna be able to complete this degree. I'm gonna have to go home and fry French fries. But as long as you persevere, pick yourself up and continue to try that you will be successful. Um, as I was leaving Hopkins, I was the, the first African-American woman to get a PhD in physics there. And I still felt a sense of isolation. So I decided to start keeping track of all of the Black women in physics. And we've been so fortunate to have so many here at this conference. Um, I established the, the listing containing all of these women and then later turned it into a nonprofit so that we could help to celebrate and offer a few scholarships. Um, I left Hopkins and I went to the US Patent and Trademark Office, which is located just outside of DC. But I've been a full-time teleworker here in Florida for almost eight years now. So while some people are still making the adjustment to working from home, I've been doing it for a long time. Um, I want everyone to know I'm not recruiting, but the Patent Office is the American Scientists and Engineers Safety Net. We are almost always hiring. And all we're looking for is a bachelor's degree in a STEM field. Um, my job title is actually electrical engineer. I heard some speakers earlier say that you can't be an engineer without the engineering degree. All of my degrees are in physics, but my job title is electrical engineer. And I believe that you can take that professional engineer test, um, licensure test with a STEM degree if you have the appropriate experience. Um, so I've been at the patent office for about 15 years now and um, I love it. I mean, I think the intellectual property affects everyone. Every one of us has had some idea where we see a problem and say, man, I thought of that. I wish I had filed a patent for that. I'd be a millionaire now. I could retire. So um, I hope that um, I've given you a little bit of information about myself and about the patent office. Um, and I'm open for questions after Julianne. Now, well, tell us a little bit about how you came to found the African-American Women in Physics Incorporation. Yeah, well, Right now, as we sit here today, there are approximately 100 Black women who have ever in the history of this country received a PhD in physics. And that number is, is just abysmal. So one of the things that we want to do is figure out ways to help to encourage people to persevere in these fields. And the best way to do that is to surround yourself with a good um, tribe. So even though you may be the only black student at this, you know, PWI working on your PhD, now you can connect through the internet and through our different groups so that you can talk to other people who are the only black student in their department. You can talk about, you know, how much quantum mechanics is giving you headaches or how you can't find a date in Iowa or whatever the case may be. <laughs> so one of the things that we do is we try to bring people together. Um, it, it really started off just by trying to build a community around myself. And so we're really happy to be able to help so many other people. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Pola, Polar Larkin, uh, tell us sure. a little bit about who you are. Well, believe it or not, I just realized something. Dr. Valentine Miller and myself have something in common beyond physics. I want to first give you just a big, just some, a big just raise the roof, very old and antiquated, I know, but I'm a Rattler's baby. Both of my parents are Rattlers, so that's why I care about what this HBC MOU is about, because I am the product of that, even if I didn't graduate from one of those. So I want you to know, I feel you on both fronts. I mean, we should be besties. We're going to have to end the call early. Absolutely. So I'm a physicist of a different flavor, all right? Don't get us confused. I'm a medical physicist, which means that I use my physics skills for good. I save lives every day. And the reason why I chose my particular career path is because my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer while I was doing one of those REUs, the research experience for undergrads that I mentioned before when I was just a physics undergrad student. And so once my mom got that diagnosis, I realized something that I needed to change my own life trajectory to ensure the best quality of life that my mom could have. At that particular time, everything changed for me. I didn't just want to be an astrophysicist. All of a sudden, I wanted to know what could I do to help all the other mamas out there. During the course of her treatment, 
She receives radiotherapy. Now, this is something that I do believe lots of people, regardless of your background, are scared of. You don't have to be a minority to be scared of radiation. And so the first day of treatment, the most beautiful thing happened at her Miami Center. Everyone came into the room to explain to her. Sorry, my video keeps, um, video feed keeps moving out. But they came in and explained to her the process of how she would be treated and introduced her to the medical physicist on the team. I want you to know my little 19-year-old self, my head blew. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what is a physicist going to do to help my mom? Why is he in the room? And he explained to me the role of calculating to the, um, to the nth degree how much radiation dose is necessary to kill the tumor lodged in my mom's chest after her residual surgery. Once he explained to that, I developed a whole new life plan. I decided that this would be my career. I didn't know that as somebody in STEM, outside of being in medicine directly, that you could save lives. So all of a sudden, I decided that I would apply to every single medical physics program that was available back in that time. And trust me, it was only seven <laughs> at that particular time, but I did try out for every single one and got into the graduate program of my choice, and it was UCLA. There, I joined the biomedical physics program, got to start to do actual medical physics research, understanding exactly their interactions between radiation and matter, as well as within the cells, and how that actually changes the actual outcome for patients based upon how you actually modulate the beam. Once I started to see that and what was available and how many moms and dads and children that get impacted by this kind of work, oh, my whole entire life just changed. It made my teeth wider. So getting that degree helped to really sound to me exactly make me understand why STEM was so important and so vital. After that, I did what's called an actual physics residency program so that you can be working alongside the physicians and learn how to apply your physics skills such that you do save lives in a correct clinical manner and develop the clinical know-how just like your physician cohort so that you can talk to one another readily as you work together once you become certified. I went through the process of getting certified, and now I'm actually a service chief for two different programs at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So I've been through the whole process of being the only one, the only black woman in a lot of spaces, and the first um, in the biomedical physics program at UCLA and all that. And I will tell you, being the only chocolate drop is not the end of the world. It brings on the attention, which is both a plus and a minus. Use that glory to your advantage. With all the eyes on you, because you feel it, you feel it, go ahead, brush your shoulders off, and give them something to look at. That's what I'm going to tell you. And so I, I just want you to own it. Find something that speaks to your heart so when you have those long, dark nights of, why did I get into this? I hate this stuff. This is boring. All of a sudden, your why is bigger than the big what that's facing you right then. And that's what's going to carry you through. Remember why you're getting into it. And I'll tell you, for me, medical physics is the biggest um, the biggest thing that ever happened to me, and I am so happy every single day I get to reach out, touch a patient, and help them live that much more longer. Can you tell us uh, uh, what your current job is? So as a medical physicist, we actually work alongside our um, physicians, uh, radiation oncologists, and actually deliver treatment to the patient in the therapy clinic. So I am a service chief, which means I overrun a group of medical physicists who help to oversee the processes for thoracic and GI radiation oncology treatment. Wonderful. And you work at, you're an associate professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Cancer Center, correct. Yes. All righty. Well, we have two questions in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Miller, how is it that you are an electrical engineer but got a degree in physics? I'm looking to take that route. And so uh, this is Andrea Thomas who's asking that question. Well, I would say to Andrea, as a physicist, you know we believe we can do anything because all science and engineering is based in physics. So what you want to look at is what is the job looking for? Um, a lot of times as physicists, we feel like, oh, well, they're not hiring physicists, so I'm not going to apply. That would be a mistake. 
employers are looking for skill sets. They're looking for people who can do have critical thinking skills. They're looking for people who can attack difficult problems and break them down and solve them. And that's what physicists do. So there's plenty of physicists whose job title includes the word engineer. Make sure that when you're looking, look at the skill sets that they're looking for and match it up to the things that you have to offer. Wonderful. Any any other response uh, uh, to uh, Ms. Thomas? I think that's an excellent uh, response. Uh, she also, there was also someone that wanted to know uh, the name of the nonprofit um, scholarship fund. So if uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Miller, uh, Valentine Miller, is there, uh, do you have some names of, of, uh, of we are uh, a nonprofit scholarships? Yes, we're a very small nonprofit, but we're we're scrappy. So we, we do some, some scrambling to make sure that we get money for students when it's needed. If you go to our website at aawip.com, you'll find how you can connect with us there. And, um, and we can, I mean, we don't really advertise our scholarship because our numbers are so incredibly small. But once you connect with us, it'll be very simple to find out. Wonderful. I, uh, I, I want to... Uh, yes, another question? Yeah, I, I, I just want to say how inspired I am by Dr. Pollard Larkin and Dr. Valentine. Uh, incredible personal stories of achievement and purpose. And so I, I commend you both and uh, certainly uh, serving as a role model, even for ex professionals, but certainly our college students as well. Uh, one of the questions was about, uh, about finding support. So at the undergraduate level, uh, I think they hit the nail on the head about involved in undergraduate research. But for those that are majoring in biology, chemistry, and physics, and physics is the foundation of engineering, uh, Dr. Valentine Milley. So you're, you're exactly right about that. Uh, but I would encourage you, if you're interested in pursuing a master's or a PhD, the GEM program is Graduate Engineering for Minorities, but they offer uh, support uh, for uh, all majors in STEM. Uh, just, just Google uh, GEM organization. Uh, they provide uh, a lot of support for those that are interested in pursuing a master's or a PhD. In addition to that, find the school that, that you wanna go to and demand to see what kind of funding that they have. Uh, most of your major institutions have funds for underrepresented groups in STEM disciplines. And so the opportunity for you to get a master's or PhD is there with, uh, with majority, if not all of the support to uh, get that graduate degree. Wonderful. I also wanted to, uh, uh, we're winding down and I think we're gonna uh, end uh, a few minutes early. And I think you all would appreciate that because this has been an exciting day. Uh, I do want to clarify a couple of things about um, medical school versus uh, engineering school. Uh, while you may have a degree in English or in the humanities, uh, it is a requirement that you have STEM courses. And if you go to medical school uh, and you are, uh, before you can even get accepted, they won't even look at your application, not unless you have done uh, biology, chemistry, the, the sciences. Uh, they also now are asking you to, to uh, participate in what we're calling emotional intelligence uh, kinds of things and, and, and have some humanity courses, uh, you know, literature, uh, drama, you know, those kinds of things. But your score is really important. Before any student can walk through the school, any school of medicine, you've got to take some national exams. And one of them is that ultimately that colleges consider, it's not the be in all, but it's the MCAT. And now they've, they've changed the MCAT score so that it's much more of a totalitarian score representing your total uh, experience. So while engineering is particular and spectacular, uh, there are requirements for medicine as well. And if you want medicine and you want engineering and you're in the humanities, 
you've got to take some science courses. So that means that if you're if you are uh, a first year uh, student and you you got this hankering that you want to be a doctor, but you you're taking uh, you chose English and uh, or math, you want to seek out an advisor uh, right away, and you want to start studying uh, and doing the research and. And these, those speakers that have been here today have been incredible and passionate. I would, I would say to the students who are listening that they would not mind getting a call from you or an email uh, because they too uh, can uh, get you on the right path. And so I want to, uh, uh, Dr. Hargrave looked like he wants to say something else before we segue to the to the closing of the session. Dr. Well, Hargraves? I, no, I will yield to uh, Dr. Valentine Miller. Uh, I was just, uh, again, going to say how much I appreciate this, this, this day and, and, the, and the, the feedback and the stories and the inspiration for everyone that's been on this conference. So uh, Dr. Valentine Miller? Yes, I wanted to um, to kind of piggyback off of what Dr. Matthews Juarez was saying. One of the things that I do is to help physicists go into non-traditional career paths. So I actually have some data for you on medical school exams versus majors. When you take the MCAT exam and they look at what majors are people majoring in and what are the top scores, the top two majors, mathematics and physics. That's right. Looking at the business school exam, the top two majors, mathematics and physics. And when you look at the law school entry exam, which by the way, is just a logic test. They even have a section called logic games. Mathematics, physics, statistics, and astro are the top majors for taking that LSAT. So you can take this bachelor's degree and you can go off and into any number of directions. While of course we're encouraging you to go towards medicine and towards engineering, Trust your heart and follow your, your instincts and do the things that your heart really wants to do. That's right. I also want to point out that the careers of the future, honestly, have not been invented yet. That's when right. I was an undergrad, there was no career called influencer. There was no data scientist. And there were only five engineering majors. Now there's like 15 or 20. So <laughs> get a solid foundation in your fundamental sciences and you'll be well prepared to go out into the world. That's right. That Excellent advice. As we wrap up this wonderful day, I want to uh, bring back uh, Dr. Uh, Bernadette Hintz. And I want to uh, talk about uh, just three points. One, that when we wrote this grant back in uh, 2016, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about how could we help HBCUs uh, get into engineering. Uh, and there had been a program uh, that had been started by T Tennessee State with Lamont on and with uh, Lane. Uh, and I read about it and, and thought about it and we sort of put it in the grant as a, as a consortium of schools. Uh, Dr. Hans was very excited about that. Uh, however, it had never been done before. So again, I want to tell you how, how I really respect her flexibility, her, her vision, and her forthrightness when it comes down to making it happen for HBCUs. I couldn't attend the first meeting, the program director's meeting, but Veronica Burns, who is a program director for the program, who you'll meet tomorrow, uh, went to that meeting along with she Dr. She Sheila Peters. Uh, they uh, took pictures with Dr. Hansen. They had a fabulous time. And as they were leaving, they started to talk about why don't we re uh, look at the MOU that we used to have with the other HBCUs? And out of that came a meeting during a, a blizzard. <laughs> it wasn't quite a blizzard, a snowstorm <laughs> in Tennessee and Nashville. 
And we were sitting in the room with uh, Dr. Keith Hargrove, uh, Sheila Peters, uh, Veronica Burns, John Barwick, uh, Barfield, the prior uh, program coordinator, and Dr. Francis Williams, who is the chair of the Department of Engineering. And out of that, in December, came this wonderful uh, agreement. And so as I offered in the last session to present this to Dr. Uh, Hans, we have now presented it as our outcome measure and would like to have her say a few words as we uh, began to conclude this wonderful session with these exciting uh, presenters. Dr. Hans? Can you hear me? Yes, your mic is on. Great. And we, oh my and we see you. I am so excited. I did not expect to hear about this MOU today. This is wonderful. It is so exciting to find so many colleges that can work together and come up with such an outstanding, stupendous, horrendous, large, grand outcome. I cannot wait to write this up for the department. I don't know how <laughs> we're all gonna be able to take a picture together but we have to some kind of way Photoshop a picture and let everybody know what you've accomplished. Perhaps this will be a role model for some of the other schools. It's difficult to start an engineering program. It is expensive to start an engineering program. So to leverage your energy, your efforts, your commitment, your tenacity, and to get an outcome in such a short period of time, Y'all have just worked wonders. I'm so proud of you. And I can't wait to share this with the Department of Education leadership. Thank you for all that you have done for the students in the future, for, for everyone in the United States. You have done a tremendous service to our country. Well, thank you so much. And kudos to you too. We applaud you. Uh, we uh, can put together a, a, a screenshot of the presidents and Dr. Hildreth. Uh, we can put together a, uh, and all of the individuals that participated. So we'll do that and put you in the center of it. I don't have to be in the center, but that would be so wonderful. The department would really cherish knowing this information. Wonderful. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone that was participating. And I want to thank the last panel because it's always the hardest. The last panel is always the hardest. So I want to thank Dr. Uh, Julianne Pollard Larkin, uh, Section Chief of the GI and Thoracic Services, Department of Radiology Physics, Associate Professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Jamie Valentine uh, Miller, founder and CEO, African American Women in Physics Inc., primary patent uh, in, uh, examiner, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. I want to thank special thanks goes out to uh, Keith Hargrove, PhD, and all those other funny little letters behind his name. Uh, I recognize the MBA, and now I know it's the PE. What the PE is. He is Dean and Professor of Mechanical and Ma Ma Manufacturing Engineering at Tennessee State University. And he's our new program coordinator uh, at TSU. And so we owe a lot of thanks to uh, TSU uh, for uh, putting us on this path. So thank you again. And uh, I have no other cl closing comments, but to say this has been stellar. This has been more than we could have ever expected. And we thank you, uh, One Joshua Group. Uh, you have made this seem so real, even though we're so far apart. So thank you again. And guys, go have a great time and Godspeed. Thank you, Dr. Hans. Thank you again for your participation you, and Dr. for sharing Matthew your expertise Warren. as we work You're to increase welcome. women and minorities in engineering careers. This has been a production of One Joshua Group, your strategic source of engagement to achieve health equity.